Mysteries of the Ancient Builders with Ben from Uncharted X. You are listening to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons and monsters and serpents. This is a Brothers of the Serpent Podcast, and we are coming to you live if you are in our Discord. If not, we're coming to you not live from the 10 by 10 by 10 Tangent Cube of Science, where we are nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed, high atop the Edwards Plateau. And uh, we just got back from the uh, contact at the canyons at Utah trip with uh, the guys from Grimerica, David Matheson. We did some stargazing. We went to Bryce Canyon. We went to Zion Canyon, did some... uh, did some Wim Hof stuff with Brandon Powell. I didn't. I mean, I helped. Actually, hey, we jammed out. That's right. We helped Brandon we were part jam. Of the trance jam. That's right. We trance jam while Brandon does the breath work. Uh, that's a lot of fun. I and was then, rocking the shaker, folks. <laughs> rocking the shaker. Been working on my shaker skills for a while. <laughs> that's right. So it was a great time. And this time we actually uh, we added a day to the um, to the trip so that we had. Uh, a sort of a chill day, and that was awesome. And we went uh, side by siding. We went, got on the yeah. Polaris, the razors, and hauled some ass through the deserts and the did uh, some spinnies in the dirt. Yep, yep. Had a lot of fun. So almost died. Yeah, several but, uh, many times, which is uh, which is kind of the point, you know. So yeah, it was a blast, and uh, I think we got a great show for you guys uh, this week. We are joined by Ben. The one and only Ben from Uncharted X. He was also in Utah with us, and we were talking while we were there. And we're like, we ought, we need to do a like a follow up Egypt trip and big picture megalithic builders episode. So we got Ben on this week, and uh, I think he's streaming, and we're streaming to the Discord, so it's sort of live and also not live. But uh, yeah, Ben, you want to come on and say hi to everybody? Hello. Yes. Thank you so much for the invite, guys. It was, uh, feels like only was only yesterday or the day before that we were talking, but um, <laughs> it's, it's it, probably it, because it was. Yes, it actually was. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And you're also going to be in Montana, right? And and the Scablands? That's the plan. Yeah, yeah. I've uh, Definitely the Scablands. I've just run into a little snag with the Montana uh, scheduling, but I'm going to try and work that out. But for sure, Scablands. I, I really want to try and make Montana as well. Yeah. Okay. But that's, um. Yeah. Yeah, we'd love to have you in both of those. And like, you know, it's it's great to have been there because he's always a a font of knowledge on all kinds of things. And he's done lots of traveling. And, you know, he's a great backup van driver in case one of us drinks too much the night before. So uh, it's... Yeah. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> van driving is life. <laughs> That's right. Jesus. That's right. All right. So let's go ahead and tackle Space Weather News. Ah! There it is. From SpaceWeather.com. Meteors from Halley's Comet. Earth is entering a stream of debris from Halley's Comet. The source of the annual ETA Aquarid meteor shower. Forecasters expect the shower to peak on May 5th and 6th. Rates could be as high as 30 meteors per hour in the southern hemisphere, but only half that in the northern hemisphere. The best time to look is just before local sunrise when the constellation Aquarius is high in the sky. Also, there was a Star Wars Day solar flare. Today is Star Wars Day. May the 4th be with you. Uh, And it began with a silent explosion. Earth-facing sunspot AR3004 erupted, producing an M5 category flare. NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory recorded the extreme ultraviolet flash. Radiation from the flare ionized the top of Earth's atmosphere, causing a shortwave radio blackout over the Middle East and Africa. Signals below 20 megahertz were attenuated for almost an hour. This is not the same sunspot that produced an intense X flare yesterday. AR3004 is a newcomer that has been growing rapidly in the past 24 hours. Today's flare probably did not produce a CME. It was strong, but it may have been too brief brief to lift significant material out of the sun's atmosphere. Fresh data from SOHO coronagraphs are required to confirm this diagnosis, so stay tuned. Current conditions... Solar wind speed is 405.8 kilometers per second. The density is very low, 0.42 protons per cubic centimeter. Uh, The sunspot number is 53. The neutron count is still low at 6.2% above the space age average. And the KP index is 2, which is quiet, and the 24-hour max was also 
two. That is your space weather news for the week. I don't understand why the 4th of May is a Star Trek day. <laughs> but anyways. <laughs> St- Star Trek. <laughs> Just a little uh, tweak of some buddies there. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. So uh, next week I am planning on giving on the podcast a, a visual presentation uh, that I gave this past weekend at uh, in Utah about some observations we had in Egypt. But giving that presentation in Utah sparked a bunch of conversations with Ben about bigger picture stuff. And of course, Ben also, hopefully everybody listening to this knows Ben's channel, Uncharted X. Uh, he produces fantastic videos and he's been studying this stuff for a long time. So we were having great conversations uh, in Utah about this. So we wanted to have Ben on to talk about some of the big picture th- stuff he's been thinking about and working on. Uh, and also discussing, uh, you know, some of our observations from our previous Egypt trip and what we're looking forward to for the next one. So, Ben. Indeed. Yeah. Take it away. Yes. I'm going to have a beer. <laughs> you can do the rest of the show. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Yeah, I'm going to need a, a break for a beer in a bit here too. Yeah. But, yeah, it was a great – and actually, so it was enjoyable. So, you've uh, – doing that presentation, Russ, it was um, – I sort of sat there and kind of interrupted – you a whole bunch um <laughs> as 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 we went through it yeah uh but it was it was what it it, it spurred in my mind because you were focusing on and this is something that i guess you you go through in detail in your next podcast is is the kind of the down tools moment like because yes. it's one of those aspects of of when you, you observe a lot of the work that happens uh, or like the the building and across various sites there's you, you'll notice in a whole bunch of places where it looks like you know tools have been put down for one reason or the other and it, it kind of spurs like well what was the reason what cost what possibly could have caused this to happen across so many different sites and different places and and everything else and then in fact and, and what I started thinking about with it was well you know this isn't just a a, a, a phenomenon that happens in Egypt we, we also see the similar things happen in um, in South America and other places in in Easter Island for example we know there's like there's that Maui head that's in a quarry yep um, there's a, bu- a bunch of other things, but it, what it made me think about was like, hey, it's because I, I liked how you were approaching it and sort of looking at one aspect of of this whole crazy ancient mystery uh, space. And and I've always struggled with trying to with trying to put a presentation together because it's like, well, you, you, you know, I always try to to, to cross the whole, the whole big picture. Like, all right, so and you're like, I need, I need the- ten days. To get you guys up to speed, and then we can do the presentation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it starts with the Big Bang, and then it moves on to, you know, it's like, <laughs> but but it it's a it's a good I think exercise to to maybe to look at the various areas that that make up that big picture at least for me, and I think that's you know, and we started talking about like well, there's you know there's there's all of the evidence for like renovation and reuse, which I think is a really compelling uh, story. Yes. when you look at, at particularly in Egypt, uh, also applies in South America. There's the thing that you know you guys have, have talked a lot about, and I'm sure uh, uh, your listeners are familiar with, is all the other adjacent fields of science that have had um, discoveries happen over the last 20 years that should be affecting the story of history. Things obviously like the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis, the extension of the human timeline, all of the work around genetics. Uh, that's a, there's a whole f- school of of new data and information there that that really should be affecting the story of history. We've got cultural and religious indicators uh you know the 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 hamlet's mill stuff D- dave matheson's um uh star uh, star myth yes. law which which kind of th- threads those those the needle between all of these various cultures and it, it all kind of points back to this idea of well was there a um, an original kind of seeding civilization that put all of these uh, myths and legends and, and and common stories and astronomical data and all of these things into all of these cultures. So there's so many different aspects to it. And then as you know, most of my work, most of the stuff that I really enjoy is is some of the engineering aspects, the you know, the, the evidence for the technological disparities between different types of work. Often you see the most advanced, most precise, um, you know, most impressive kind of stonework that's the hardest to explain at the oldest layers, at the the oldest times. That's right. Uh, you know, with the evidence for machining, with for drill cores, for uh, all of that type of thing, you've got there's other angles to take around logistics and quarrying, and and we can deep dive into that. But I think you, you, the big picture for me is is tying up because you know it's I 
I, I never want to, I can't ever say that, you know, this stuff's a hundred percent right. Like I think anytime we look at the past, it's, it's, it's an interpretation of a, of a very loose and lacking set of evidence, particularly the further back you go. It's difficult to, to, uh, to, to really have a, a, a full set of evidence. We, we can never really say that. So the best we can do is kind of interpret what evidence we do have. And I think the, the story for me, at least at this point, when you, when you take into account all of this evidence from all of these different vectors, the thing that makes the most sense, at least to me right now, is this idea that, you know, that there most likely was some form of um, as yet unknown ancient civilization that had a high technological capability uh, or capacity for uh, for doing some of these things and for knowledge, perhaps in different technological directions than, than our civilization has taken. And they were wiped out and, and we inherited a lot of this stuff and uh, or at least our precursor civilizations like Egypt, like maybe the, those in South America, but particularly in Egypt, inherited a lot of stuff and then built their cultures up around that. And, you know, in some places that kind of agrees with what, with what those cultures themselves say. Yeah. But that's, for me, that's that, that's that big picture. I've always struggled trying to put that whole thing together because well, it feels like, you know, a 10 hour conversation. Well, you, okay. So what do you think about the way that, for, for example, some of the uh, Cyclopean masonry on Easter Island and, uh, and down in South America and in Egypt, how they look so similar. Do you think that's strong evidence of, uh, <clears throat> of maybe a very widespread culture, or do you think that that's? I mean, I don't know. It's it's. I struggle with this yeah. question because I'm like, is this just yeah. the way you do it, or does this imply that the builders, in some way, were talking to each other at, at the very least? It's a it's a it's a it's an interesting conversation is it because you're right it's i struggle a little bit with it because you can't say that they're identical i mean right. there, there's definitely some some spots where they're very similar i mean the walls of in particular like the rapa nui walls um yeah uh, on easter island very similar to, to some of the work in egypt and then you can draw strong parallels between you know parts of peru and parts of egypt and there's other little bits and pieces of megalithic work here and there that that line up but at the same time they're different like in you know you, you could south america's much more of a flowing, uh, curved um, type of megalithic building versus Egypt seems to be very linear and, and straight line orientated. Although there are exceptions to both of those cases. Yeah. You have, you know, there are some straight line stuff uh, that, that, that happens in South America, but it's in the minority really. Um, but yeah, there's, have you, I don't, it's, it's tough. Have, well, you, have you been huh? to Japan? What about Japan? Like the those... I've been to Japan. I haven't seen. I've been to the palace. I, I haven't seen um, all of the megalithic stuff there. Yeah, you know that's. I've been seeing some of it lately. What's interesting about that big wall that people see in Japan is that it's actually really thin. Like it looks like a huge stone, uh -huh. but from what I understand, it's it's actually only fairly thin. So it's not like massive and thick like a lot of megalithic work typically is. But there's one good example that everyone shows that picture of. It looks like a huge megalithic wall. Yeah. The, the, I think it's only a few inches uh, deep, so oh, that stone. But, okay, yeah, it's but, kind of strange. Yeah, it's but it's still but, it's like you see this megalithic. That's almost like a facade they're trying yeah, to make it look like yeah, older facade. stuff that they had seen. Yeah, I mean that's like what we replicating do. Replicating some older stuff. True, it is, isn't it? And and your point is that, that maybe that's just the way you solve the problem. Like, is this just the way you do the stuff if yeah. you're really trying to solve that problem? Yeah, I don't know. I I do think it's an indicate to me. I I take it. I'd, I'd probably take it as an indication of, of some form of connection. Now, maybe it's uh, different phases of a of a similar s civilization, uh, and, and like maybe an evolution of a similar technique that happened in these different locations. Um, impossible to kind of date a lot of that stone accurately, I guess. Yeah. But yeah, I, I've got to think that there was some sort of connection going on with it, whether it was you know people talking and communicating and maybe sharing data and information on how to do it. Or it could have it could be different parts of a similar civilization. It certainly seems to me that, given all the evidence, and particularly the you know you look at things like the Great Pyramid and the the the, the data on the Earth that's encoded in it, where they clearly understood the shape and size and dynamics of the planet, um, some of the fundamentals of nature. They understood longitude. Then it was and you know it was likely a global civilization to some extent. Um, and there's even some some evidence for that in the earliest parts of the Egyptian civilization that I think they could have inherited from their ancestors, things like connections with the Australian Aboriginals and the boomerangs and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, 
it seems like yeah, that they're, 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 that civilization, that that builder, call them the builder civilization, certainly had the capability to be global. But you know, I just don't know. I, I you know, it's not. It's it's a funny thing when you get into the timelines, right? I don't think this is necessarily a civilization that was just there fifteen thousand years ago and then got wiped out by the younger Dryas. It's possible to me that that could be far more distant in the past. Um, you know, fifty, yes. sixty, a hundred thousand, maybe more uh, years ago. And was wiped out by a cataclysm before that, like well before the younger drives, because we know they happened. Yeah. Um, and but- is it that that's <clears throat> that's kind of one of the ideas for Peru, right? That the that the yep. sort of puffy megalithic stuff we see in Peru, like at Sacsayhuaman and stuff, that, that's actually the second level, the second stage of building. Yeah. That wasn't the yeah. oldest stuff. The is it Hanan Hanan Pacha? Hanan Pacha. Yeah. Yeah. Which was like rock yeah. cut as opposed to yep. uh, megalithic. Yeah, and that's another thing. You, and and Jesus Gamara and his video, I think it's called the Cosmogony of the Three Worlds. It's a like an English DVD, kind of hard to find. I do have a copy of it. Um, and he makes a case to where you can see those three styles all around the world. I mean, in Peru, it's the most obvious that Hanan Pacha, mm. and by that we mean it's it's kind of the monolithic style. It's not cellular. It's it's carved from the living rock. And you yeah, you, you know, we typically South America. Most people typically think of like the walls in Cusco, the Inca Roca walls, or the walls of Sacsayhuaman. Those are the cellular megalithic style. But there's a an older style that's associated with sites like Kenko. But you see it on uh, lots of sites. Alente Tambo has it, you know, um, even at Saxe Huaman, there's sections of it. And it's this it's these carvings that are carved into the, you know, quote unquote living rock of the mountain itself. It's not, right. not blocks, it's just shapes carved into the living mountain of the rock. And it's incredibly impressive. This includes stuff like the Inca thrones, people call them, the little steps that are cut in. You have like pool shapes and just odd um, carvings and like almost like there's been an acid dripped on some of this stone and it's just carved its path down and really strange. It's, it's you, I really don't know what to make of it. All you know is that it's been carved. This isn't natural. Right. It's not really a quarry shape either. Um, you can, you can definitively state that because in some places you'll see a quite literally a, like a, like a, a three-dimensional rectangle cut out of a piece of rock, which doesn't make any sense at all if you're trying to quarry a piece. Yeah. Because you can't cut that away from the rock. You have, you know, you've carved that stuff out of that rock. It's it's hard to explain without the visual, but yeah, because you, know, you there's can't no way cut, to cut it away. You can't cut the very backside that you don't That's have right. any access to. Yeah. Until the pieces yeah. right. It's not removed. like they were quarrying a block out. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, because that's the orthodox explanation. Like, a lot of this stuff was the quarry for for these some of these other things. So I haven't seen just, I haven't seen the stuff in Peru, but I'm I'm curious. You know, after looking at at the um, the quarry in Egypt and you know the the flattening of the stones and in the Osirian and at the third pyramid, um, it looks like the same type of tool that would have been used to do the rock cut stuff. Is that would you say that's yep. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, in fact, so, and I, I, yeah. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, like, I, I, I briefly alluded to it on my last video. If people haven't seen it, is, is specifically about the quarry and the scoop marks that we see in the Aswan quarry in Egypt. And there's always been this debate about the scoop marks. You know, is it pounding stones? What is it? But you can find those sort of scoop marks all around the world, like very, very similar scoop marks. You see them on on the stones at Saxe Huaman. You definitely see them in the Hun and Pacha work. You do see them on the megalithic stones themselves, and even Hugh Newman. I threw in a clip from him saying that he's seen all those scoop marks at Stonehenge, and a couple of mm. examples. I think I threw up a photo or two in there. But yeah, it seems like it was the same. It may have been the same type of tool. Yeah. Um, so the same technology of tooling, but a different style of building. Yeah, like slightly different style of building. There's. It's really weird. Like to me, it's like the bet. And Russ, you focused on this in your presentation in Utah. Was we talked a lot about the third pyramid, the Menkare pyramid? Yeah. At, or you did at 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 Giza, which is the you have that pillowy look because they're it's sort of unfinished granite on top, but you know it's just a front surface that's unfinished. Everything else, the sides of these blocks are finished because they're matching each other. Yep. That's what you take a picture of that and you you look it up, you line it up next to like the Inca Roca wall. In, or one of them in uh, in Cusco, and it looks very similar uh, because you have that same pillowy effect on the front and and very precise kind of uh, matching mating surfaces on the sides of the stones. It's, yes, it's, yeah, it's really it looks like eerie. It look yes, and it looks stylistically like you would match it up. You know, that's what I'm saying. It's like if you were looking at it, at it as it 
at it as art, you would say this is the same artist. You you yeah. recognize the style, you know, or maybe you would say this yeah. is the same style of art, which implies that somebody's yeah. talking to, you know, that people are talking to each other, that there's yeah. a connection there somehow. Um, and yeah, the oh, I think there has to be. Yeah, it, it seems like there has to be. But there is still the question of like, is is this just? A, I don't know enough about stone masonry to say that this is that this is definitively, um, you know, that you should connect these things. Or maybe it's just, you know, maybe a stone mason would say, well, no, this is just the way you would do it if you're doing this job. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, maybe. I mean, it's just it's you're right. There's you could it'd be interesting exercise to kind of line up the differences and the similarities. Yeah. Uh, because it again, you know, I mean, if and and if when we get down to Peru with you guys, I want to show you like the the Corricancha is probably the, to me, the interior work of the Corricancha. It's it's very straight and linear, and it's just bang on for Egypt. You know, it's like the mm. blocks in there have that have that that unique kind of going around the corner style, and and right. just it's like a smaller version of the Valley Temple, mm. almost almost exactly the same. But then, you know, so much else of it is is this flowing curving stuff but you know that said the megalithic work say at Silistani and the Chulpa Towers and there's a few other sites that are down towards the lake a lot of that's very much sort of straight lined yeah you could you could take pictures of it and it'd be like you, you wouldn't be able to other than the coloring of everything else and the, the green sort of uh, tones of, of Peru versus the, the desert tones of Egypt they'd look identical yeah um, if it was just close up of the stonework with nothing else in the yeah. photo yeah you couldn't tell yeah that's right yeah, and, and those, yeah, those those, those Chulpa towers have blown my mind for a long time because they just look yeah. and it's you know it's not really clear what they're for either. I get, but they they're like, oh, these were tombs, you know. <laughs> but like, they were for sure used that way eventually. Yeah, and yes. you can you can see the imitated. That's another one of those good examples of like, you know, imitation. Like like uh, this. I think this is a really interesting aspect of ancient Egypt because people you get that question a lot, right? It's like, well. How come? How come the statues, these giant statues that you talk about, and these ones that are so have all this precision? How come that's what? How come the Egyptians look like that? Like that's what, what right. they painted on and everything yeah. too. I'm like, well, if you if you were as they said they were, kind of a legacy culture with this thirty six thousand year history from Zeptepi and the Shemsu Hor, and maybe and just go with the idea that you did inherit stuff, you may have also inherited this whole the whole stylistic culture you you might have inherited a bunch of statues and had some understanding of what they look like so you would for damn sure dress yourself up if you would these were the gods that walked the earth and so pharaoh is gonna want to look like that he's gonna want to claim that he's a god he's gonna want to capture as much significance as he can exactly from the past and from those ancestors and you don't have to look very far in our own culture to see the same sort of things like the i made that joke i think we're in utah about you know the pope and all the different hats and you know, you look at our religions and the way all that dresses. I mean, this all has traditions that are rooted in history and previous cultures, and and it's all symbolic. And they're trying to capture that stuff. There's meaning behind all of it. That's right. But, and it's not it's not as if we just made up that style. And and it, they, you know, the Pope and the bishops and all these guys dress that way just because that's how they wanted to dress. It's like no, no, this is all coming from history. And I think you just got to you might have a, another whole example of that in in Egypt, playing this timeline out. Uh, so the same thing with the Chulpa Towers. So you go up and you go to these sites, Silistani. Um, there's another one, um, uh, Katimbo, which is just a hell of a hike uh, up at Lake Titicaca to get up to, but it's worth it. Uh, you And you have these megalithic structures. Some of them are square, some of them are round. Uh, incredible megalithic work, precision, big blocks, you know, granite, this type of stuff. And then you know, scattered around, you'll have the small block, the, the, like the really rough work, basically imitating it. And, right. and it's... You know, apparently, according to the Orthodox timelines, oh no, no, that's just all the same people. I just did it differently. I mean, that doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, right? <laughs> you see right. that? You see that in a lot of places. Isn't there? Isn't there one of those towers that has? You know, it's it's this beautiful megalithic, smooth down stones. Uh, you know that that kind of sort of cyclopean mm-hmm. style. And then there's a a rough cobblestone ramp. Oh yeah, yeah. There's a few. Yep, they they're almost trying to preserve them. It feels like they were like trying to either cover them up or it's a there's ramps on either side of them, and some of them there's like stones all the way around them, not quite all the way around, but uh, yeah, there's a bunch of them with ramps as well. Okay, uh, I was thinking, I was thinking like, well, if they were be if they were using them as tombs, the ramp is the only way to get. To, get there's no entrance except at the top. A lot of the, well, they a lot of them have entrances okay. at the bottom. 
Okay. And they all face the, I think they face the east. I might be wrong, but I think they face the east. And you can get in, I've been into a few of them. You crawl into them. And there's, they were definitely used as burial sites, like yeah. there's skulls and, and stuff in them. That's, again, not necessarily indicative of what they may have been originally. Right. Or what, what they were for. Because you always have that mystery of like, how did these blow up? Because there's quite literally strong evidence that they exploded. Like, it's so uh, strange. Like there's, the, particularly at Silistani, there's like blocks from, uh, some of these towers and they just spread over quite a, a distance. And these are big blocks, like five, six ton blocks, some of them, some of them even bigger. Hmm. Um, it's insane. Like, yeah, I don't know what was going on, but they're kind of spread out across a wide, wide areas. The black adder quotes like, what should I do if I step on a hand grenade? <laughs> well, well, Baldrick, standard procedure is you leap up 10 feet into the air and scatter yourself over a wide area. <laughs> <laughs> You guys watch Black Adder? That shit's good. No. <laughs> you gotta watch Black Adder, man. <laughs> the world of entertainment. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, that was unexpected. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I, I want to think that there's a connection. The the masonry can show a connection back to that, yeah. you know. And then there is there's evidence, like we were talking about at the beginning of work being done that stops suddenly and then is never completed, which is part of the mm-hmm. part of the presentation that I'll be giving next week and what yep. I, I did in in uh, in Utah. So the idea that these people were in the process of do you know, well, I mean, the idea that I have in my head, I don't know if this is true, because what you're saying is like, you know, how how old is this really? And, you know, did all of these job sites where they were in the process of doing something did they all stop on the same day that's the other question that i have is like if we could date this stuff would we would we get an indication that this all sort of happened at the same time you know in other words a global event stops work ends the civilization that's capable of doing the work and that's why Mm -hmm. it's never been continued that's what it seems like to me yeah yeah i mean that's i don't know what other explanation to make for but when you have a kind of that type of thing happening across a wide area. Like you can imagine maybe one site or this site might stop because a particular king dies or something like, like we've seen in other examples. Like yeah. I think it was SETI, the tomb of SETI, like they never finished the artwork in his tomb because it's like he died and it's like his son went, you know what, let's have you paint something else. Right. Um, but it happens, it seems to have happened in so many different areas all of a sudden. And you know, some of them are big tools down moments, like the, yes. the box that's unfinished in the Serapium that's sitting in the middle of the hallway. Like, it's like, what? Who? Come on, yeah, you know, Johnson, take this thing out of here. Like, <laughs> what you, leave that thing in the way. What are you doing? That's right. But <laughs> we see it all over the place. But I think what complicates it is is this idea of multiple phases. I, I always try to caution people when they look at the past. It's like, remember that even even with the standard model, you're still looking at thousands and thousands of years of you know, ups and downs inside of civilizations, different civilizations, construction, deconstruction, reuse, renovation. Like, yes, it's hard to know what you're looking at. But if you take the longer view on some of this with things like, um, you know, South America with the the incredibly ancient looking Hun and Pacha, that, that monolithic work, then you've got the megalithic work period, which, you know, seems to have been not as old, but, but is still very ancient. And then you've got the Inca work and you have similar situation in, in Egypt. It's like, well, how, were there more than one sort of down period, and was there was there more than one kind of, um, let's call it, high technology building phases, where right. megalithic building phases? Uh, yeah, it's hard to say. Yeah, uh, and I, another I, another interesting question, you know, going back to what you were saying about if it is the case that the ancient Egyptians inherited a lot of this stuff, uh, and then the pharaohs are making themselves look like these gigantic statues because they're you know mm-hmm. it's sort of a cargo cult a bit. Yep. Uh, yep. Advanced cargo cult, I'd say, because they they the Egyptians were also very good at stonework and they yes. were quite advanced. But still, it makes you wonder what those statues were for if they were not depicting pharaohs. Um, because they're you know like we can look at the boxes and say, well, these seem to be functional. Uh, the pyramids may have a function as right. well. We don't know what it was, but they seem like machines when you're crawling around inside them. Mm-hmm. But what the hell are the statues? Well, I, I I don't think there's any argument. I mean, for me, it's like clearly they're they're symbolic and and ceremonial. Like they may well be depicting the, the ancient kings, or it seems like 
and this is the thing because they all seem to have the same face. You can make the study. There's been a few studies done of they're not all exactly the same. Yeah, but there's a lot that are very very similar. Like it's the same face, and you have that other element of it where it's it's like it's and and this gets back to the the studies that have been done on the symmetry of them and stuff where it's it's almost it's it's so symmetrical and perfect that it's almost inhuman like it it, yeah. it has this touch of the alien almost about it with, with these statues so it may, it may not be a single a specific person so much as it's representative of a of a race or a culture or something like that but i don't think you'd make much argument that that they're functional you know to me it's like yeah like you said the boxes i think had a function and and some of these sites may well have had a function with their sub you know their underground u-shaped blocks they were clearly piping around some material underneath the floor the different types of the basalt the limestone the white calcite the granite like these combinations of stones on sites along with the pyramids and the underground boxes that may well have had a function and, and i feel like it, it it might have um but the statues it's like they're, they're to me they're um they're still ceremonial like they're it's still artwork it, it yeah it's artwork be. yeah but but they're you know they're they're also they've benefited from this manufacturing technique that has all of this precision in it. And I think you, they, I think they, the manufacturing technique used to make these things and, you know, they developed the precision because they needed it for the functional aspects of the stonework, the boxes and whatnot, and maybe some of the columns, but you know, the, the slabs and the blocks and things, but then they could apply that to, to some of this work like the statue. So you end up with this incredible symmetry and precision. You've got the same type of machining marks, the tube drills, the saw cuts, the overcuts, things that are very indicative of some powered powered process going on. Uh, but yeah, that's, I you know, it seems, I, I think it, it has to be symbolic or or just, yeah, ceremonial, like representative of, of that culture. And then that's, when you when you combine it with the idea that the Egyptians started with a bunch of knowledge and culture, maybe their religion, maybe their, um, you know, that some of those stories, and and they might have had some, like you said, a cargo cult. They might have had some memory or at least stories of this capability. So if the pyramids did something, or there was some energy source, or there was some something that happened that that enabled this high technology civilization, they might have had some cultural memory of that. That they then tried to capture through ceremony, through, um, through, through, you know, I guess just ritual. Yeah, ritual. And it, yeah, as you, I think you, you made a good example. We we're talking on the weekend about like, and I often say this as well. It's like if another cataclysm happened, you, you would, ha you within a couple of generations, you'd have people sitting around a campfire talking about plasma TVs and cell phones like they were magic, and you might end up with guys doing things like polishing black bits of rock to make it look like a cell phone and then, yeah. you know, dan dancing around it at the fire, trying to activate it and turn it on because, you know, once upon a time, that's right. the ancestors could use these shiny black rocks to, to communicate across the globe or to get pull information from the air and, and answer any question or whatever. Like That's right. That's, <laughs> it's, that's, that's it's, to me, I think. It's weird how some just talking about that sounds like – certain legends of things that we that already exist you know so it's yeah. it's just yeah. it's so strange and you can see how it could happen again yeah for sure all right well let's let's take a break we'll come back with more from ben with uh from with ben from uncharted x there we go <laughs> i got it in the end there <laughs> awesome Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Brothers of the Serpent podcast. We have Ben from Uncharted X on talking about the big picture uh, as it relates to the ancient world and all these megalithic sites and the building or the builders of those sites and w what does it all mean? Tell us and, what it uh, means, Ben. We came here with nothing but answers. <laughs> And that's why I haven't been talking at all. So. <laughs> Go, Ben. Give us the answers. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I don't know. It's it's. I wish I had the answers. I'll tell you that. But I just need that time machine. It's that eternal debate. Where would you go, and to what period of time would you go? Mm. 
Man, that's a hard, that's a tough question. Yeah. Well, you focused on your last video, you were focusing on the quarry, right? Yeah. And uh, it does, it seems like, and this, I don't understand, let's say, okay, so I don't understand why the pounding stone idea is still the mainstream theory. I just don't get it. Uh, It seems like we should, I mean, okay, let me let me attack it from this direction. When was that theory first come up with that it was pounding stones? Since you've just done all this research, do you know roughly? It, it yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was around 1850. It was um oh man, I just need to pull up the name of the guy. What am I doing wrong here? Uh, Stop the show. <laughs> Stop the show. I forgot I to get beers. Made, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> um uh let's see. Sorry about this. It was uh it's no problem. The, I know the name of it was um, uh, Reginald Engelback. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, so Reginald Engelback, and I've, I quoted from him extensively in the video. So Engelback was a British engineer. He was um, born in 1888. Worked with Flinders Petrie as his assistant for quite a while. He was an engineer. Uh, took a great interest in Egypt. Came back, did a few of his own, um, few of his own projects. In fact, it was. Well, bang on 100 years ago now, uh, I think, was when this first came up because he, he really did the first excavation and detailed study uh, of that obelisk in, I think, was it uh, 1922? So, yeah, he, he was it was at the, you know, 100 years ago, basically, and he was the one who uncovered it. And he's like, well, I found we found all of these dolerite pounding stones. So this, he literally, there's a quote that I, I read from me. He's like, well, there's no marks. There's it, it The obelisk itself and in these areas, we don't see... You know the the wedge and chisel uh, marks, the dash lines where you yeah. you know you chisel out, slam some wood in there, and wet it and whatever. We don't see those marks, so the only thing left to us is like there's these balls laying around here. This must be what caused these marks, and that's literally most of the evidence for it. Like that's he's just like, hey, that must this must be the case. Um, and so you know you, you sort of can fun. I guess you can look at it and think about it. So, but there's a bunch of problems with the with that theory when people dig into it now. One of the things that I highlighted in the video was that there's been a bunch of tests done. Like so, Engelback did some in with his work where he basically went and tested what rate of you know material removal can you get from pounding stones. Like slam on this granite patch, how fast can I remove granite with the dolerite? And is it because you will remove the granite very slowly? You, you know, basically in the form of granite dust because the dolerite's slightly harder than the granite. You're pounding away, it's not the most pleasant thing to do, but. Um, you can test it. It's also been tested by Mark Lehner and um, uh, Roger Hopkins, I think was his name, who was a stonemason. And, and these guys, Lehner's obviously the Egyptologist. I, I do, I bought, I found a copy on eBay of, of the Nova documentary series where they did this work. Mm. Uh, it was called Obelisk. They, and so they went and were tasked to try and, you know, create an obelisk and uh, very quickly had to resort to modern methods to get it done in any, you know, they had a time frame they were working in. So they ended up doing it with power tools and bulldozers and stuff. But, um, and, uh, you know, they tested it. And then, you know, you've also got, um, who's the other, uh, Dennis Stock. So he's a famous kind of experimentalist also in a lot of these documentaries with um, with uh, with uh, Mark Lehner and the Nova series. And they, all three guys kind of tested it. So there's, there's some understanding of the material removal rates. So you, you've got like vast disparities between them is the, is the problem. Like Engelback was... Like twenty five times faster rate than than Dennis Stocks, who was the one who measured it the most accurately. He actually measured by volume of stone removed with this pounding stone method, which is very very slow. Uh, I think where is it? It's like a couple of millimeters um, per hour. Not even that. It was. Uh, God, I don't have the I don't have the numbers right on me, but it would it would take. I think it was something like a. It takes an hour of pounding to remove half the volume of a golf ball's worth of granite. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So there you go. That's to give you an idea. So think about, or three quarters the volume of a golf ball. So it's like, look at the, look at the, you go look at the unfinished obelisk and it's got this giant trench all the way around it and you just visualize that thing filled up with to the brim with golf balls, then add 25% because it's, you know, 75% the volume of a golf ball, so another 25%. And that's how many hours it might have taken under optimal conditions with this pounding stone to, to, to dig that trench. Not to mention the fact that, well, you've got all this material that was removed on top of it. The trench around it's only two thirds as deep as it needs to be for a square section obelisk. And then you've got to cut underneath it. There's all sorts of problems with the 
pounding down and you know sideways and upwards because we've got this undercut issues. But the pounding stone theory itself, um, I, I, and there's some history here that's probably worth explaining. I didn't get into it in the in the documentary in in the video. But the reason Engelback had such a high rate, and this is kind of where the the, the theory took hold. And then he 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 did his rate, which is like something like five millimeters an hour, was what he quoted. I, and literally all we have to go on is he said, well, I sort of pounded on a square, you know, a square, a, a, a foot square patch of granite, and I got it down five millimeters in an hour by pounding at various times, in an hour. So he took breaks. Hmm. And he, he said, well, and we just have his have to take his word for it. Then he assigns the ancient Egyptians eight millimeters an hour because they're like, well, they would have been better at it. Though. They're better at so it. Yeah, we just give you a sixty percent bump up in in capability the reason he was doing this is because there's an inscription on one of the hapship set obelisks that says this obelisk was completed in in seven months oh yeah so he was trying to work backwards he's trying to figure out okay how can i get to a rate that makes sense with this with this inscription on this obelisk uh, of seven months and if you look at that particular obelisk and you do the and you sort of work it out he was so he, he kind of figured out well if it's eight millimeters an hour we're in the same ballpark as what Hapshipshet could have done. Now, again, this is like twenty-five to thirty times faster than than any rate that that Dennis Stocks or or Mark Lehner had been able to do with all of their testing. Uh, and so, it sort of, you start to question, well, okay, what's this ancient legend mean? And and this gets back into, I think, this gets back into the the topic of kind of um, reuse and recycling and reclaiming objects because. One of the things that I contend, and people talk about this a fair bit with obelisks, is that as good as some of those glyphs are on obelisks, and this is something that uh, I've seen Yusuf talk about, and he's a stonemason and kind of makes this point pretty well on the site, as good as a lot of those glyphs are, they're still done by hand. And this is done in later periods of the Egyptian civilization. They had access to iron tools. You can still see the chisel marks in some of those glyphs. Mm. Uh, that you know, But on the obelisks themselves, the, the actual things themselves in some cases you'll see overcuts and saw cuts and things like that you don't see any of that in the writing ah. so i think i think what's a likely situation here is that when those when those men wrote on that obelisk and said we finished this in seven months i think they mean they finished the writing on it in seven months right yeah i think there's a good chance that they 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 had either you know they had scaffolded their way up this thing and they figured out what they're going to write on it. They got all their craftsmen and arts and art artisans in there and they carved it up and they had it finished and dedicated to Hapship set in seven months because there's no way they could have done this with any pounding stone methodology. And this is, this includes like, you know, there's supposedly, well, this is the, the quarrying, the shipping, the standing up and the writing on it in seven months. You couldn't dig that thing out in seven months with that method. Right. Let alone all the other steps. So the only thing that makes sense to me in this situation is well, if the timing is true, then it's then it fits the the rent of the the reuse and and inheritance scenario really well. Right. So you um, looked into the excavation of the unfinished obelisk. Did you uh, in in any of the that guy's documents? Did he say that they found those dollarite balls in the rubble down in the uh, you know where they were excavating yep. the obelisk? Yeah. Hundreds of them. Yep, they found they found them all over the place in the quarry. So as they excavated, so the, the the quarry. If you go back and look, he's interesting. It's an interesting book. You can find his work, Engelback's work, on archive.org. If you want to look at the illustrations for yourself, I have a lot of them in the in the YouTube video. But it was cut like it wasn't. Doesn't look anything like it does today. The obelisk itself was covered in something like seven meters of debris, not just dirt and sand, but huge big quarried blocks. And there's actually like just chip fields and it was there was roads over the top of it it was all buried like it, yeah. it they've they've removed a whole lot of material since then so so that's what i'm yeah, wondering is is like like say for example in the trenches around the obelisk if there were dolerite yeah. pounders found in other words when that thing was cut you know were there dolerite was, pounders left in the actual work site or what did they fall in there because of later people right. that were pounding stuff with them or i don't know uh it doesn't spec. It doesn't specifically say they were in the trenches. I suspect they did. He did find them there, and he would have found them at the bottom layers of a lot of. He, they found all over the quarry. What he said, everywhere they they went, they kind of found these things. What That's What's interesting. interesting about the pounders themselves, though, is that most of them were broken. Like he doesn't. Mm, that's yeah, the thing yeah. you, you don't see a lot of broken ones there now because then they've removed most of them and the ones they leave there are the the you know the whole ones where you can pound away on the stone yourself and try it out. 
but most of them were broken. And this isn't an easy thing. With dolerite balls, you can't, you're not going to break them by pounding. Like, the, and Engelback did some experiments and he's like, huh, how did these break? How come most of them are broken? He said he had to go up 10 meters or 30 feet and repeatedly just throw a, a ball down onto a big pile of other dolerite pounders multiple times and oh, then eventually he'd get he'd get one to split that's a great point like you're not going to break it using it the way they say that they were being used yeah but you could right. you could break it if they were like ball Rollers, bearings or ball something. bearings yeah, exactly giant yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah yep you got a 1200 ton load on top of those things and you could imagine maybe once you snap if you think of like a obelisk or a big huge block of stone in a trench like you've dug it out of this thing you and you you put these balls underneath it then you somehow snap this thing off its spine yeah now you've got a little bit of flexibility. You could maybe lever that thing around. You could get underneath it and chip away the spine. You could, you could put straps. You could put stuff underneath it. So it yes. might have been desirable to have some, like almost like ball bearings and, exactly underneath it. And this move, would make let that thing move a little bit. This would make all the pits the way they. So when they were cutting undercutting, the obelisk is tilted, right? The whole thing yep. is at an incline. So if yep. the surface under at the bottom was smooth all the rollers would roll to the bottom but ah, because they're right. scooped and scooped and scooped yeah then the round yeah. then the, the the you can position all of those that's, rollers all the way down the side oh man and they would stay put that's a that's a great i hadn't even thought of that, that yeah that's a great observation yeah very very interesting actually that mystery might, solved because that was that was the other point right it was like there's no point to dig those scoop marks at the bottom of the trench right. yeah <laughs> you, unless you, you need just, rollers to stay there, mm -hmm. unless you need a pit for a roller, right? Because otherwise, you, other if that, you know, half a golf ball in an hour, you just you, you, there's no reason to dig yeah. down lower than the ridges because that's the level you're huge to get waste to. of time if you're dude, pounding yeah. it away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, that that does make sense because that's what we see too underneath the like that one wedge shaped block that where we've got the undercuts. It's in a it's in a area kind of up above the uh, the obelisk okay itself, when we that's well, exactly what we're seeing when we go back we should collect a bunch of the pounders and put one in each of the scoop marks <laughs> all the way up the side and take yeah. a picture of it <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah yeah we'll do operation distractor i'll get you guys down into the trench you just got to film it for me okay i got in there on the first trip but they were yelling at us last time and they wouldn't let us on it but right We'll, well, yeah, we'll see. It's going to be busy, I think, this next trip. We'll see yeah. how much we can get away with. Well, we wait. We'll wait because we're going to have so many people. We'll wait until they're distracting them somewhere else. And then we'll yeah, the <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, people yeah, are asking about uh, heating the stone, hurt. heating the stone before pounding on it. Is is that possible? Did you? Sure. Yeah. Did you see any of that I mean, in the reading? So they did a little bit. Of, yeah. So so there's some evidence for that, like that that, that happened. Um, but I would also say that there's there was there's evidence for multiple types of quarrying like we just have evidence for almost every type of quarrying imaginable it was a source for granite probably throughout the ages right so um and and hopkins did a little bit of testing with this too uh they sort of run a fire on the granite for a while and then and then bashed off some some material it didn't it doesn't seem like you can get a whole lot more material out that way you might be able to get a little bit more i guess i think what you would do is heat but, it and then pour water on it and that's then right. pound it out yeah yeah, yeah. so and there's some evidence that suggests that the dynastic Egyptians were doing some things like that. Like they were they were gathering reeds, they were drying reeds, they were burning the reeds. But you, I, I would like to see it tested. To be honest, there, there's there's um, there is some testing I think that's been done on some of this, but it's not. I wouldn't call it conclusive by any means. But it would be an interesting experiment to really to to transparently go and look at. Like, okay, can we can we actually um, when you take into account the effort and the time required to, you know, gather the materials, make the fire, yeah. uh, heat it up for long enough, quench it, then clear away the mud that that's going to form, then pound oh, up, yeah. Yeah. then hit it and, and get that material out versus just like constantly pounding on it. Are you actually removing more material per hour uh, than the other way? Yep. I don't know. Yeah. But there's for, for sure there's like burnt bricks. Um, they found burnt bricks in parts of the quarry. So it looks like they were like – they made mud bricks and they may have made areas to contain a fire. Um, and there's – in some other areas apparently there's like little burnt bits of granite. But, you know, I, I, I just wonder – like I'm not an expert at this, but it's like to me it's like how much granite are you really heating? It's not like we're talking about pebbles. It's like right. bedrock. How far is that heat really going to go? Are you going to yeah. get much more than a couple of millimeters of granite off that thing from yeah. the heat? Yeah, and, and it it's takes, just regular fire. It's not like it's propane, right. like an oxyacetylene torch or anything. It would take a long time to get it to heat it hot enough to to just. I mean, 
because most of the heat's going up. And then, and then yeah. once you get underneath the work, what are you doing? Because you th- then all the heat's going straight into the work where you don't want it to split. And yeah, right. yeah, just uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's it's a tough question. It's but again, I'm not I'm not really certain that explains the scoop marks. Um, even if they were quarrying that way. Uh, so right. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's Still it's a bit of an unknown. But marks. I also think it's I I don't know what to think about this, but I think it's weird that that thing is tilted. Yeah, there's right. something I don't know that I feel like there's something there that 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 unfinished obelisk is not flat. You know, it, I, I don't know. I'm not sure what yeah. to think about it, but it seems like you would cut it out of there flat. Uh, when you look yeah. in quarries. And at least in modern day quarries, they don't, you know, flat. yeah, they're always, the, the lines are Isn't the, um, horizontal. The, what is it? The Moai statue, the unfinished one is that one also is tilted, it, right? It looks like it's a little tilted. Uh, yeah. It looks like it's tilted. And well, and the, the go ahead. I was going to say that the, the blocks in the, um, Baalbek quarry are also on a tilt, but that may be sinking. Yeah. Uh, it's not clear uh, that they were, they're not attached I, to the bedrock anymore. So. I think the one on the bottom beneath the stone of the pregnant woman is oh, still okay. attached. Maybe it's still I think attached. It, and, it yeah. is, and it is tilted. And it's tilted. Yeah. So it's like they didn't yeah. care that it was tilted. Yeah. Or well, it's a nine meter difference on the obelisk. So the top is like yeah. nine meets, like 30 feet. Yeah. Like, yeah. Something yeah. like that. But difference. now, if you were, if lifting and maneuvering the stone wasn't really the biggest problem, <laughs> the biggest problem might be finding. Um, Solid the best piece of yeah, the stone, good granite, right? Yeah. So you wouldn't care what the angle was. It's like, oh, this is this is a good piece of granite all the way down to here. Yeah, you know. seems like it. It seems like it because that's the thing that gets me about this stuff. You know, when you look at and it's, I just, I probably should do a better job of digging into this topic because yeah, I try in a few of the videos. You've done a terrible job so far. <laughs> it's a terrible job. Well, it's it's the extrapolation of of that good granite, you know. Like yeah. every time you you take stonemates or people that understand granite, and I've learned to kind of recognize some of this. But you go to Giza, or the second pyramid, third pyramid. You look at some of the cut pieces of granite, and it's huge. And same as these boxes, like these huge crystal occlusions in them, like yeah, big chunks of quartz in this stone. This is not the type of granite that we like to work with today because it's the hardest thing to cut. Like finding granite with, with huge crystals in them like that it just makes it so much more difficult to work but that stuff is everywhere like i'm talking probably be millions of tons of it over the course of everything yes. at least millions of times like tens of thousands of blocks and, and big blocks and columns and single pieces all of that had to be carved out like i just that extrapolation of using these tremendously slow and painstaking kind of manual techniques and trying to explain the just sheer scale of work that happened with those things, it, I think it starts to border on the ridiculous to me. Like, yes, I, like I said, I'd like to maybe dig into that at some point and try and extrapolate, like, just how many hours, how many people are we talking? Because I think we've got there's some estimation about population size, uh, yeah, uh, in ancient Egypt. So I think that'd be a fun exercise to try and work through. Because, yeah, I just don't know, you know, like the this. Okay, so we're grinding with copper bars, and how much copper do we require? Because it eats away at the copper at this rate, and it, it takes this slow. Oh, and we're pounding. So let's assume there's we had to pound out all this material out of this bedrock, you know, all this granite stuff, and just start to add up some of that math and see just how many people and how many hours it might have taken. I think I think we'd find it would be astronomically stupid. Where were they getting those pounding stones, by the way? Is there a source for those? Does anybody know? I, well, I mean, it's everything I read is like well, river worn rock, so they must have somewhere in the Nile, I guess, or somewhere like that, where they mm. were in the in so some they were bringing naturally somewhere. rounded. Dolerite yeah. stones. So they're like, already, okay, yeah. go up and down the Nile and find <laughs> yeah. round, like this sort of similar sized round pounding stones. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, and you need, by the way, also a few thousand tons of copper at least just to, because the that was the other, th- when you look yeah. at the soaring and the grinding me- mechanisms, I mean, everyone's like, oh, they grind on it with sand. Sure, but it also eats the hell out of the copper. Right. Like copper just, just it turns into dust. I mean, it's just... You would you'd have to basically replace your saws after every cut, just about. So right. that's a lot. And we've never found we've not found a single copper drag saw. Oh. You know, we've not found a single tube drill. We've not found yeah, anything right. like that. Yeah, we, we found some flimsy copper chisels and some you know like that don't do anything. And we know this. And Roger Hopkins is sit there banging away on granite with a copper chisel or bronze even does nothing. So 
we, as much as we theorize about some of these techniques, this is what Yusuf also says that's really interesting is that we found they found a lot of of those of saws and tools that they used on wood. Mm. For sure, they use these things to make their wooden artifacts, but we've not found a single copper drag saw or a single tube drill, anything like that that is meant for the stone. The only thing they found are these little copper chisels, pounding stones and flint chisels. Um, so even the even the mainstream story of of well, it was you know drag saws or it was it was tube drills that were just rubbed on sand. We there's no evidence for it. Like just, there's no tools. That the where are the tools argument applies equally to the to the, right. to the standard version that it does to our, to anything alternative. So. Yeah, it seems like there would be evidence of all that copper use, even if it was just I don't know dust. Yeah, yeah you would have like huge yeah. green areas. <laughs> there is it isn't i mean we yeah. we do see we see copper tinges on uh places where there were copper insets so i remember there's like a great example of a of a section of an obelisk that had glyphs on it at abu Sir, and there's like some of those are green because there were these copper insets on that and it's a good example of like well that's never going to last long people are going to grab that and take it and right. it's all gone so yeah that's exactly what happened um but yeah you just there's no you know there's a funny reference petrie made at one point when he was first investigating some of these saw cuts, and these are like the the circular saw cuts and the tube drills, he has this one. I can't quite remember exactly how it goes, but it, it was it was along the lines of well, he he sort of found one of these saw cuts, and he thought that's strange, and he noticed there was a powder in there. There was some. Mm. It wasn't copper. It was something else, and he went, oh, that's interesting. Moved on, kept doing stuff, and eventually, like a day or two back, came back to it because he was on his mind. He came back. I want to get some of that. And then when he came back to it, it was gone. Ugh. Like there was no more of this residue left, all this powder. And he's like, "Damn it!" He actually makes a point saying, "Wow, well, we could have had a clue there as to what this material might have been because it was uh. there was something in this saw cut <laughs> that he had uncovered, and it was just gone when he got back." Rookie so, move, Petrie. Yeah, rookie yeah. move, Petrie. <laughs> <laughs> what a loser! It just, it's, it's fascinated me to think like, oh man, what what might what could that have been? Because he, he does say it's not copper. It wasn't the yeah that 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 green copper thing. It was something else. Mm. So maybe it was. You know, there's just no evidence of diamond use. Like, we don't know what they use to cut these things, uh, or what technique or tool tip or whatever. But you know, we just yeah. Petrie favors the gems, right? He talks about right. jeweled tips. Yeah, but it wouldn't have been yeah, he, diamond. So something else. Yeah, he. I can't yeah. remember the name of the other one, but he was saying it's it's been found in other places around topaz or corundum sapphire. Yeah, corundum. Corundum. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, he he says like the the obvious thing. He says diamond. Like he does say like this. Yes. Would, but there's just no evidence to support diamond. Like there's yeah. literally no. And other people say oh, it was diamonds. Like there's just nothing to support that in dynastic Egypt. Like they just don't ever talk about diamonds. They've never found any. They mm. seem to have valued the colorful gems. They don't think they found like See, if it was like a white gem, they wouldn't have cared or a clear gem. Huh. I would um, I would imagine that if they were using like like our modern day diamond tip saws, like these diamonds are really small. Sure. And then by the time they're you're done, they're either, you know, they break off and I mean, you've got all this dust from cutting stone. Are you gonna just look at this pile of dust and be like, Oh yeah, there's a diamond in there? Especially if you're in the desert where there's a bunch of sand, like no, yeah, this is going to yeah. take a forensic analysis to yeah, find these yeah. diamonds. And so it, it it would be cool if there are you know future quarry sites that are uncovered and 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 yeah. uh, had not been previously excavated that we could go down there and then actually collect some of the dust in the very at, bottom yeah. and analyze yep. it with a microscope and see if there's any tiny pieces of jewel. Yeah. Yeah. Or diamond yeah, or whatever. <laughs> Things that would all make sense if the mainstream actually cared about really digging into right. some of this yeah. stuff. Right, yeah. It thinks they're right. Because, I, I mean, there's quarries. There's, there's the Wadi Hammamet quarry. I'm sure there's some excavation that could be done there. There's like a black granite site in the in the eastern desert. There's a, a basalt quarry that's just north of um, uh, the Fayum region. Yeah, that would be uh, a place to, to look side. to. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I actually want to try and see that if it's at all possible at some point. Yeah. But well, we should bring a plastic yeah. bag, bro. <laughs> That's right. Let's <laughs> take some samples, dude. <laughs> get some granite. Yeah, let's get some. Well, some basalt. It's even tougher. Yeah. yeah, it's um, it's tough to say. Like, yeah, there's, there's. I think there's definitely some things we could do to try and figure that out. But yeah, I, I think there's no chance of finding anything at the Aswan Quarry. Right. Um. Yeah, it's been cleared yeah. out. Pretty much it's been yeah, cleared it's just, out. But, but, you, you know, can go so, there and create granite dust. Well, like you were saying, you know, if if only the mainstream cared, like did 
just the number of pits and various things that we saw, like on Giza, on the plateau yeah. there, that just, you know, it's like, have they ever oh, been yeah. dug out? Have people really gone down in there? Like, why is it full of rubble? You know, mm -hmm. how far down does it go? Do we actually know any of this? And, you know, there's like this kind of lock on archaeology in Egypt that makes it very difficult to do anything. Like, I want them yeah. to go into the Valley Temple and just tilt one of those freestanding columns and scratch a little stone off the bottom of it and then do a luminescence mm, testing testing yeah. on it and see how long that thing's been standing there. Sounds like it makes sense to me. I'd yeah. love to see that as well. Like. You know, yeah. you could do that in the Osirian. You could do that in Peru. Like, you know, there's this idea of we can't yep. date stone, but we could date the bottoms of some of these very large blocks if you just can go in and tilt one and get a sample off the bottom and do a luminescence. I think you might have to pull the whole column up out of its socket. In the in the Osirian? Maybe. Yeah. yeah I bet you that thing goes down quite a ways. You're probably right. Well. Yeah. Maybe difficult, but it's doable. Like I said, like yeah. could we build? You, you were talking about like could we do it? We could. It's yes. just a, it's a matter of willpower and money. Yeah, and does you know, <laughs> and desire. It's like, you know, it's just it's just do we care? It's just I you know, it feels like that a lot of the times they're not interested in doing stuff that's going to rock the boat. But at the same time, I'm hopeful that the like the muon detection shows us something in the great. Yeah, pyramid. we don't know. I I want them to I want them to do that thing to the other pyramids as well. Right. <laughs> Definitely to the bent pyramid. I was really thinking mm -hmm. about how all that stuff we climbed around in in the, in the bent pyramid was below the bend, way yeah. below it. Yeah, yeah. And Kafre pyramid as well, because that that's yeah. pretty much at ground level for all that stuff. Yes, it's this. It, I mean, it's a little bit into the superstructure, but not much. There's a tremendous amount of stuff above it. Yeah. All right, let's take a break, and we'll get yeah. some beers, and we'll be back for the second half of the show. Indeed. back ladies and gentlemen this is the snake bros institute for advanced copper light studies where there are no degrees only certificates of ignorance that you have to print yourself or draw with a crayon or dust off the old typewriter or something and we are joined by ben from uncharted x and we are talking about we're just kind of rambling about uh, ancient mysteries and the builder culture and uh, what we think about the processes and the methods they may have used. And is there a connection around the world to many of these mysterious ancient sites where they seem to have preferred megalithic blocks, uh, where there's sometimes anomalous stone cutting or evidence of anomalous stone cutting possibly. And the seeming ridiculousness of the tools that the standard model of archaeology tells us that were being used to make these structures and these objects. And uh, Ben, have, have you looked much into the, you know, Stonehenge and the other stuff over there in the... A little bit. Yeah. Um, haven't visited them. I, it's on my list now. We got to do that. Yeah. Now that the UK has opened up and after talking with Hugh Newman uh, quite a bit about it, I'm, I've always been fascinated and I, I would love to have him show me around. Yeah. Over there, I think that'd be a great way to do it. Um, I've looked a bit into it, <clears throat> so it's it's interesting. You have the, you know, we talk about the megalithic culture existing all around the world. The other thing that I was thinking of is that seems to be a, a constant, and, and definitely you get degrees of of difficulty or of, of of I guess achievement in this. But pyramid culture itself seems to be something of a constant, right? That that's. Yeah, you get pyramids all over the world as well, and yes. maybe that's just a hey, this is the way we build the staircase to the gods or to the sky or whatever. Maybe that's how we solve these problems. But you know, China, South America, all over the place, we've got we've got pyramids and evidence for pyramids. Yeah, um, it's just that what are we talking? It's just the easiest way to stack up rocks, Ben. <clears throat> just make it. Yeah, giant, maybe make, that's it. Make giant triangles. <laughs> <laughs> you know what this desert needs? <laughs> yes, yeah, triangles. Right. You know what this desert needs? Some giant stone triangles. <laughs> well, I, you know, the the other site we were talking about in Utah was um, 
we were talking about Nan Made All. And yes, yes. also how it's it's somewhat similar, at least to the top parts of uh, Gunun Padang. I don't really know how to say Gunun it properly. Gunun Padang? Yeah. Yep. Uh, how yep, they use the, the, the columnar basalt, you know? Yes. So at columnar least... Columnar being another hard word to say. Yes, columnar. <laughs> so yeah, the, 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 it's interesting how you see this. I don't know. I always think of it as Lincoln Log construction, but they were using enormous... Uh, sections of columnar basalt that they quarried from somewhere. Yeah. And from what I remember, I could be wrong about this, but the quarry site has not really been located, at least not for Nan made all. Um, right. And they, they used so much of it that they must have <clears throat> practically dismantled a mountain of the stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, this is another thing I wonder about because it's just like, oh yeah, you know, you just take this, you just take this mountain apart and then you um, stack <laughs> them up like this. And it's real simple guys. Yeah. But where did the where did the how difficult is that to really do? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I've I've got a lot of good video footage from Gunan Padang in Indonesia, and where where we we so you've been there in the end. No, oh. um, but my buddy Luke, when we were working together, he he went there, and I, so I have hours of footage. I do want to get there. Ah, it's, it's a place yeah. I'd like to go, but I have I have hours of sort of detailed video footage up and down that place. Mm. Uh, from the top down, down kind of the sides of it, and that appears to be a similar similar deal where it's it it may well be a, a man made just massive uh, pyramid. Yeah, the uh, whole pyramid the shape, the whole hill. Yeah, possibly. Yeah, because the pictures that you can see in this is like of the excavations. It's definitely like been stacked up. Like there, there seems to be. It's not. It's not the natural kind of formation at the bottom. It's it looks as stacked as as because one hundred percent the terraces on top of Gunan Padang were uh, formed from columnar basalt and they were man-made, but it looks like that at the bottom where they've done excavations as well. It's just that whole place is just covered in jungle, so it's kind of difficult to, mm. to, to to clear off and really really figure it out. And then you've got all the debate about the the chambers and the organic dating that's been pulled up from there. But, yeah, Nan Madol, um, where, where, where was it again? We decided, we figured it out. It was um, uh, <clears throat> somewhere in the South Pacific. Yeah, Micronesia. Micronesia, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think the island is called Pompeii. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And it's it's underwater, right? Yeah, so most of thing. it's underwater. Like, I mean, what we see, it's it, and the parts of it that are sticking above water are on basically man-made islands. Um, yeah. so it's it's off the coast, and it just seems like a lot of work. Uh, <laughs> to build what looks like a kind of a city or a village, I guess you would say. I don't know what it was initially, but. It just seems it's another it's uh, to me it's another example of like what's the hardest possible way to do this, you know? Yeah. <laughs> let's <clears throat> let's do it out of gigantic, you know, columns of columnar basalt. Yeah. That weigh hundreds of tons in some cases. That's big basalt. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah. It's a lot bigger than the stuff you see at Good and Padding. Right. They're, these things are huge. Some of them are absolutely enormous. Wow. So it just I don't know, and it's. You know, the lo yeah. the local legends about it, you know, like was just mentioned mentioned in the chats, you know, the legends is that they were floated into place, you know, right. that they were whistled or sang whistled. or, mm. and, you know, but basically floated into place. And I don't know, there's just, uh, just the legends about these places, about how it was done overnight or, <laughs> you know, if, yeah. it was easy. So it, it's another commonality, right? It's another part of the big picture. You, you have that. Tibet, you've got that in South America. You've got that in Egypt in some cases. You yeah. know, of, of floating the stones or singing the stones or whistling the stones or using the 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 like the Tibetan one that had that uh, Swedish guy go. There's a really interesting story. Oh yeah, I you know I still I still have them. I have this. I was, I've been meaning for a couple of years to do like a deep dive into the acoustics and the legends of that type of thing. It's just like I'm trying to do it justice. Um, but it's it's uh, yeah I've, I've, I mean I haven't finished it yet but it's something that's been on the back burner forever but yeah there's, there's so many interesting stories when you dig into those legends of and stories of people you know uh, wh somehow moving these stones with sound uh, right you know and and or, or I think there's a legend in Egypt of a particular type of stone underneath the stones that they would that would somehow le levitate the stone and they'd be able to push them along like oh. the stories that come from Egypt from that as well like there's some really yeah, interesting tales, and who knows how much you can attribute to the truth of them. But 
Well, the you fact know, that they, I, they stop as things exist from all around the world is like, huh. This yeah. Is... Well, I do have like a, it's not really <laughs> scurpy, but it's a, a little bit on the whole resonance and floating the stones thing. But like, mm -hmm. if you're, if, if you're not near a job site, like a modern one, but you can hear it, all of our machines make whistling noises when they're operating True. too. So it's, you know, yeah. I don't know. Is it possible that, that the sounds they were hearing was machinery? <laughs> you know, I don't know. Yeah, not sure you know what's interesting is <clears throat> when i looked into one of the things i noticed when i looked into this was if you you so we you can you can 3d print now you can find designs for like a, a acoustic levitation devices right you power them yeah. up and you can float small objects it's interesting to note the shape of those devices because it looks like a half sphere it's like this circular mm. bowl almost type of shape is, is what gets used to create those sort of yeah basic sort of acoustic levitation things you can 3d print them or whatever it but you you we find these types of stones and they're really <laughs> yeah. mysterious and these types of shapes at, at some of these oh, ancient yeah. egyptian sites yes. you know yeah that's true famously abu Ghraib, there's a whole bunch of them and they're like you have this cog bowl shaped thing you think of it as like half a sphere or something like that that's that's carved out of a block but it's in a it's in a square foundation so you could imagine these might have been in the ground or lined up and i know we found a couple of these at tanis as well that's um, right. Yeah. Very yeah. ancient feeling stuff as well. And, you know, it's just, I don't know. I, I'm not saying that's what they were, but it's an interesting connection when I, when you look at like, well, this is the shape that proves to be the most functional for kind of acoustic levitation that we can do today for small objects. And funnily enough, we have these crazy bowl shapes also existing in. Yeah. Giant ones. Some of these ancient sites. Yeah. Huge. <laughs> yeah. And made from crystal. Like, right. And, and and ones made from limestone as well, but you know, and and, <clears throat> and we don't really have an explanation for what they are. And they're intricate, you know. They've got these crazy cog shapes on the outside. They've got holes drilled in them, halfway down. Yeah, uh, I know Yusuf seems to think that that's where you would connect them, maybe pipes into them, and and then that's how these might be connected into the underground system of piping, and and, and conduits that seem to exist underneath the ground at so many of these old kingdom sites, which is just to me also another whole mind bending aspect of them. That, that screams some sort of functionality. Right. The, Don't know. Yeah. You know? Yeah. The, the, what do they call it? The, the sewage system? Is that what they were saying? Yeah. It was? That's, that's, that's what they call it. Yeah. <laughs> sewage system underneath, like made from granite or yeah. alabaster. <laughs> it's so, it's so the one priest that lives in there can take a crap inside the temple, basically. Yep. 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 <laughs> yep. Someone should measure them for the, you get the, you know, the one and a half degree of down drop across foot there, son. Just make sure the thing flows downhill. That's right. Shit's got to flow downhill. I, I don't know. And then it collects into like a red quartzite bowl outside. Yeah. yeah. You, you have them from like fairly difficult material, like particularly the white quartzite, like this. this yes. You know, natural spring material that you've got to dig got up the, from very specific places. The calcite. In. The calcite, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Quartzite, calcite. Yeah. White calcite. Travertine, whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah. Uh, you see it made from granite. There's a block. You have them at, at Giza on the causeway up there in front of the middle pyramid. You've got a U-shaped block made from granite. We've got um, another one from um, from that from that white calcite. Uh, and I know there's blocks like that from granite in the Sphinx Temple. Not that I've been able to ever get in there and see it. Maybe that's something we can do in the future. But yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Like, it doesn't the seem like you would make the, them from that material if their purpose was to you know, carry on poop. <laughs> right. <laughs> Do you know why that temple is closed, the Sphinx Temple? Like, why is it closed? No. I don't know. It's hard to get into. I've been discussing with Yusuf. There's, a, there's maybe a chance we can get in there on this. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> um, we'll see. It's, it's apparently – it's a difficult to get special permission now, but uh, apparently it is it is possible now, but it's not – it's very rare. So it's – we're going to – we're definitely going into the Sphinx enclosure – Yep. So we are news for anyone who's coming on the trip. I am working on maybe the ability to to get in to see it because the Sphinx Temple for people people get confused about what this is. It's sometimes people think it's the Valley Temple. It's right. not. It's kind of if you're looking at the Sphinx and the Valley Temple, it's to the right. That's right. Uh, of the Valley Temple itself. So there's like a, a whole megalithic structure like the Valley Temple, but it's it's in front of the Sphinx and it's got a bunch of interesting details and it's. It's shut off to the point where the, the literally the gates that get you into it are welded shut. Like they've been welded shut for a long time now. It's weird. Uh, man. And you know, the, so Robert Temple has some good photos from in there. He does some lectures um, 
looking at some of that stuff where I know because that's how I know there's U-shaped blocks in there. There's a few things in there. I don't think Yusuf's ever been in there either. Uh, so, yeah, it's been shut for a long time. But I'd love to get in there just to, to see it and document it. Yeah, I just think it's strange that it's closed like that. I don't know. It's a little <laughs> weird. Man. Yeah, that just that's the trend, you know. I mean, that's been closed for a long time, but uh, it's you know if they keep cutting off access to to places. Although it's it's nice. I mean, Egypt's slowly opening up. We've had the change in leadership over there, so right. uh, they've definitely made some things a little easier to get into. Particularly in the last few years, it's been great. Like I've opened up the Bent Pyramid, Step Pyramid, Osiris Shaft, like stuff you just wouldn't have been. Would have been very difficult, let's say, to get in to see before that. Um, yeah. So that's another one, the Osiris possible, shaft. But... We could, uh, you could do luminescence dating from stuff at the bottom of that thing. Mm-hmm. Um, like that box that's down in there in the, the water. That's in there. Yeah. 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 That might not tell you the, that might not give you the dating for the shaft itself, but it could tell you how long that box has been. The box has been in there. Down there. I would, yeah, Same I'd love that. Sur- Go, that yeah. box. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, the Serapium, actually wonder if the, the Serapium as well, because tilt one of those boxes up and get a little sample from the bottom. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We'll push it. We'll all get together and we'll, we'll yeah. give it a little yeah. shove and we'll try and do a scratching underneath it. I think we can make I'll it. Get a, I'll get a copper lever and we'll, <laughs> we'll tilt it up. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to I, I want to go back to the discussion about, you know, the possibility of these some of these structures being much older, as you were saying, uh, possibly like, you know, maybe 30, even 60,000 years old. But the idea that um, the tools used on these job sites were um, perhaps made of some, you know, other material like steel um, or, you know, just a harder metal than copper and that they might have been massive machines that were doing this work. Um, And if the job was abandoned and these tools were left on the job, uh, just yeah. just looking at the amount of stonework that has been quarried from existing sites over the thousands of years that those sites have been around, the amount of, you know, tearing down of the site to reuse that material, I would imagine these machines, if they had some kind of steel or metal on them, that that metal would have been mined right off of the machine for thousands of years to, and, and even to be used as like spear points so, you, you know, it's like you can imagine one scenario is that the machine itself sits there untouched and just slowly rusts. And then now it's going to be a red stain in the ground. Yep. But I don't think that would happen. It wouldn't get to that point. It would be broken down into pieces and those pieces would be cut up into pieces and those pieces would be cut up into pieces to the point that it was like, you know, tips yep. on spears. Yep. And scattered all over the place. They could have been traded. Yep. For thousands of miles. Yeah. Uh, over the Absolutely. thousands of years that they were there, and they would have been known sites to go get that material, the only places to get those materials. Um, yeah. So that's kind of the way I look at it. Like, where are the tools? Well, if there were any large tools, they have been scattered over thousands of <laughs> miles into hundreds of thousands of pieces. Yeah. Uh, it's a great point. <clears throat> I but, make the, that's the where are the tools argument. You just... That stuff doesn't last. Like there's people wouldn't ha- not have a clue what they're looking at, and it's just some hard material that you beat on with a rock until you take a piece of it, right? And you can and you can repurpose it one way or the other. Yeah, right. And yeah. that you and would be a, metal, you know, metal doesn't last. You would be able to build a fire under it and get it to you know melt into a like a little piece of it to melt, and then you could beat yep. it off of there and yep. shape it yep. into something that you needed, and yep. um, and then you know those little pieces would have easily rusted away. And so the question is, is there a place where a tool was left that hasn't been found, right? That hasn't been uncovered, that was perhaps protected from the elements? Yeah. Well, we have one example that I can think of. Okay. I mentioned this in Utah as well, which is the the antikythera mechanism. Oh, right. Yes. I think that's an example of – we can't really explain that. Like anyone who really looks into the antikythera mechanism – it should upend your whole view of history. Like it's just an yes. incredible artifact. Like, and it's insanely complex and precise. And it's like that's not a prototype, right? They probably made lots of these, and right. they, they may have existed for a long, long time. And the only reason the damn thing is we even know about it is because it sunk to the bottom of the sea and it was being corroded by the ocean, and it would have disappeared eventually as well. But it was found on a shipwreck 
and you know as bad in, in as bad shape as it was just by x-raying it and doing all the, the scans and the analysis of it we've, we've been able to determine all these things about it but if that type of a mechanism had been somewhere else it'd be long gone like as you say melted dusted up just yep. reused everything metals so there's a reason we don't find metal on these sides they're so rare to find right some of these things but is it possible that that there's a that we'll be able to find some of these tools on a site somewhere? Uh, maybe, you know, it's, it's it would have I had think to it, takes have, a, it would have had to have been hidden from the ancient people for like the entire time. Basically, yep. that, that's yep. that's the point I'm trying to make. It doesn't yes, have, it to have to just to sit and rust away, right? It's going yep. to be taken. Some people were that's in the, right. Some people in the chats earlier were suggesting that maybe some of the tool bits became the Egyptian crowns. Yeah, possibly. Oh, yeah. that's the drill tip. <laughs> it's the drill tip. <laughs> that's the, what the bowling pin hat thing is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's the Maybe, resonator. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was exactly. Yeah, it could be something like that. Actually, they, I'm, that's a great idea. It could possibly be that way. And I think, I think it also has. It's not just that it would have to have been hidden from ancient cultures. I think you have a very an, an, another kind of qualifier you need to add into it, which is that you almost have to. If this is going to be at an undiscovered site, it's going to almost have to be a situation where, where it's a tools down situation. They had to leave because yeah, who who leaves their tools on a job site? Like the the, the thing is, these are probably were valuable, and as much no one today, like when you finish a house, you don't leave all your tools lying around, right? You take them with you, you put yep. them somewhere else. Johnson leaves so, at least one. Johnson, <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, <laughs> so maybe we find Johnson's you know ten millimeter wrench, or socket <laughs> yeah. wrench, or whatever, which is the thing everybody always loses. <laughs> we can find a hole. This is where all the ten millimeter sockets are. But um, yeah, so it's like it's it's doubly difficult, I think, because you don't. I don't think that it, they, they would leave the tools on the job sites, which are the sites that we're you know the the monumental sites that are, we're looking for. So yeah, it's a very it's like a it's you know it's a needle in a haystack in a field of haystacks kind of thing. It's yeah, yeah. it's um. That's why I wonder about the Osirian. You know, if Seti the First, he gets his engineers out there and they uncover that thing. Maybe there were tools in there. Maybe when yeah. they uncovered it. Yeah, because this is that the idea yeah, that yeah. that these so many of these megalithic sites are just unfinished and it looks like they just stopped in the middle of the job. Yeah, you don't yeah. take your tools home from the job every day. Like you rent the crane, and it's right. there until you're done using it. That's right. Yep. And if you, yep. and if one day you go home and then some crazy shit happens and you never come back, then the crane stays there. Yeah. Yeah. So that, you know, that's kind of the, the idea I was working off of. Yep. Or, or even at the quarry yeah. itself, it's like, if you're quarrying, you have machines that are built on site. Yes. Right. Right. At least yeah. that, that's at I, least that's how we do it now. We don't know what their tools looked like. I mean, of course, yeah. yeah it's right. just, but you you just imagine that they must some of them must have been enormous. Like that's just the the implication that you get. Yeah, I guess my it main point like is yeah. wherever the tools are, because you might have a yard where you keep all the tools. You yeah. know, if you're a business and you're you know like uh, yeah, I'm pyramids one. You know, like <laughs> yeah. Max pyramids, Tri triple A pyramids. <laughs> yeah, triple A pyramids. It's like <laughs> we have a yard with all of our pyramid tools. <laughs> <laughs> and when we get a job, you know, we we move all the tools to the Roll job out. and start doing the job, and then we bring them back, and they they sit in the yard and get maintenance. So it's like, if a cataclysm wiped these people out, or or they, something happened and they never came back, those tools would have been left on the job, left yep. either not on not necessarily on the job, but in the yard. Yeah, in, yeah, yeah. And then and people would have known about it. Is my point. Yes, so that's right. So we have to find a, a, a find a tool or a set of tools in a very specific situation where, like, sort of like Gobekli Tepe, where it was buried in antiquity yeah. and no one knew that it, that it existed for twelve thousand years, yeah. and yeah. it wasn't uncovered, right. it wasn't taken apart, it wasn't destroyed, yes, it wasn't that's the elements what I'm didn't. About. And so we uncover it now, and it's pres it's practically pristine because it's been completely unknown and buried for this whole time. And it has to be in a site, you know, that would have the tools down. conditions. That would not completely destroy. That's right. The tool or yeah. the, the materials right. that it was yeah. made of, because it could still be tens of thousands of years. Exactly. And, yeah. Or more. But yeah, you're right. I think that I'd, I'd like to. That'd be a good site option for that time machine question, right? Like when they uncovered the when Seti the first dudes uncovered the Assyrian. Yes. What they actually found there. What they yes. found in there. That's what right. What they found and what happened and, with it, like and, that. That. Yeah. So that's that's a the thing that makes me wonder about the step pyramid, and all those 
vases or what was, you know, stone jars and bowls and stuff that are found mm-hmm. under there. That to me looks like somebody found these artifacts and collected them all. Yeah. In this place. Yeah. So where do they find those? So things? I'm wondering, is right. there is there a place where ancient peoples found this tool that they knew like, oh, this is what the gods used to, you know, make these structures and they revered it and stuck it in a tomb somewhere to try to preserve it. Yeah. Maybe. That'd be cool. Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of tombs got robbed. I mean, even yeah. some of these step pyramid stuff, a lot of it's busted up. There was just such a proliferation of those things they didn't they didn't take it all. Yeah. And I mean even and that's funny enough when you mention the jars, I just I, I do like to point out to people that that's literally the mainstream story as well. <laughs> like that that they were heirlooms. They were just heirlooms from the first and second dynasty because apparently that was the time where they had all the capability to make uh, make amazing stone jars. It's only the first and second dynasty. It, they they just stopped doing it after that. It just wasn't worth it. Okay, so even the mainstream says that they were put in there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, on the the wall of Sa- the museum in Saqqara, when they talk about it, they're like, "Yep, they found all this stuff." And this these he said most of these are heirlooms from the first and second dynasty. Hmm. They just say that. Yeah, it doesn't they just assume that? Like it's like, well, how do we know that? They're not heirlo- like the first and second dynasty. They weren't aliens for them as well. It's like yeah, didn't you say there was, no there was one found in a much older <laughs> burial? Well, yeah, the shit, the, the shit. Yes, yeah, there was. Yeah, that's right. So there's one from that was carbon had carbon dated material to around twelve thousand. Oof. Um, see, twelve thousand years ago, that's and what it's, I'm it's about. stone vases. It's not pottery. Like I've heard that people are like, oh yeah, but he's talking about this site with the pottery vases. They're not pottery. They're stone vases. Um, there's a difference. So yeah, some people think it's pottery on that site. I can't remember the name off the top of my head. It was a, it was a site that was uncovered in the 60s. It's like a pre-dynastic um, site. But yeah, the material in that burial was d- dated to about 12,000 years old. Wow. And there were stone vases in it. And you've got, there's a couple of pictures of it um, in the Aswan Museum, I believe. And uh, yeah, and then, you know, the schist disc, some of the most complicated, incredible bits of stonework. That was the first dynasty. Sabu, I believe, the first dynasty prince named Sabu in his tomb. And then you have most of these, you know, the 40,000 plus of them were under the step pyramid, which is Joza, I think the last pharaoh of the third dynasty. And that they, it, it says there, even in that museum, it says, yeah, yeah, most of these were, were likely heirlooms from the first and second dynasty of kings. Hmm. <laughs> which is okay. That makes perfect sense. Right. Because – you know, there's no other evidence of that type of capability of stonework from first and dynasty, first and second dynasty structures. <laughs> so I guess they were, you know what I mean? Like they obviously yeah. had the capability to, to work that stone, but you don't get like, there's no other evidence for it in, in the stonework. The real good stonework allegedly doesn't really start until the third and fourth dynasty. Right. The fourth, yeah. But then you have the, then it ceases with all of the, there's no more stone vessels made after that. Right. Just, well, they got bored. Make any sense. They're, they, they were done. They bought. You know, we've got, yeah, 30, we made 40,000. That's all we need. Joza, Joza has them. We don't need to redo that. We'll move, we'll move on to the big stuff. That's right. It's just it's one of those many contradictions in the, in the, author, you know, the standard model timeline. It's just it kind of silly. When you dig into it. That, that's It's another big factor for me. It's like there's so many contradictions in this story that just doesn't make any sense. Like the whole flow of the civilization in our, in our orthodox timeline just doesn't make sense. Yeah. It, it, it favors another interpretation, I think. But I want. I just. I also wonder. You know, the schist disc is sort of famous, but I wonder how many other artifacts there are like that. Because that thing is, you know, because <laughs> you have all the the vases and the jars and the bowls, uh, but that thing is not is not any of those things. It's no. It's something else. And I'm. It's I'm, a Zeptepi ashtray, dude. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> It's like like a giant Might be. <laughs> smoking some huge cigars, but <laughs> it's just. I'm so I'm I'm sort of hoping hoping that with the opening of the new museum, maybe they'll have more of those kinds of artifacts because they're they're yeah. supposedly they're supposed to uncover a bunch of stuff that have been in storage for forever. Yeah. So we might get to see some new stuff. I hope so. I mean, there's I've I've got photos of the literal just shelves and shelves and shelves and warehouses of all these things. So yeah, I'm really hoping they dug, they dust off a lot of that stuff and put it out to 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 pasture, because it's yeah I, I I hopefully think the same thing. There's got to be other stuff in there. Yeah. So where and did you get, where did you get those photos? Bury, well, just from the books. That there's the uh, old books like um, uh, Jean Pierre uh, Loyer, the the guy who pretty much 
did a bunch of the excavation work on the step pyramid. Like you should see the shelves and the warehouses they filled up from all the stuff they dragged out from beneath that step pyramid, you know. Mm. And we just we have a fraction of it that's on display in that Cairo Museum. There's still warehouses full of that stuff. And and I know they've it's a similar story with like the Valley of the Kings. They literally are using some of those tombs uh, because they're more or less climate controlled. They just fill them up with all the stuff they found from the other tombs and then they just close the door. Oh. And leave it there. And so hopefully they're pulling a lot of that out and displaying it. You know, I did one thing I sort of do object to a little bit, and it's just, I don't know, it's good and it's bad, but you know, they're they're taking things like obelisks from sites. Like they've yeah. taken two of the two of the big obelisks from Tannis. They're yes. gonna be over there at the uh at the uh at the museum and it's sort of, you know, just just just, just, just like a little negative thing to Tannis. Confusing so. future archaeologists. That's right. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, it's certainly a habit, right? We we love to take obelisks and yes, and we've been the moving obelisks around for four or five thousand years at least. Yeah. Make your own, <laughs> yeah. Build your it's own. Easy. Obelisks. Yeah, yeah build I'm not even sure that the people at Tanis were the ones who made the obelisks. Well, that's right. right. Like they they might have moved they them were just from somewhere stealing else, stealing them and standing them up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> possibly. Yeah. All right. It's let's all take let's there. take one more break, and we'll come back with the final segment with Ben from Uncharted right. X. back ladies and gentlemen brothers of the serpent podcast with ben from uncharted x final segment of the final hour of this the 242nd episode of brothers of the serpent it's been really great ben um as always loved talking about all this this stuff and uh i don't know um i really appreciate how you uh Dig through the data of yeah. the of of all these um, past archaeologists and find little nuggets in there. It's 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 been really awesome following your work, um, and I really like that the the latest video you did um, on the scoop marks and stuff in the in the quarry. So I highly recommend it to anybody out there who hasn't seen it yet. Um, is it still the the latest thing on your feed? Well, I guess maybe it this is. will be. Yeah, uh, yeah. This might. I don't know. This will definitely be a podcast. I might do a video on this too. But oh, okay. it, as of right now, for sure, the um, the scoop marks is the latest video. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's the it's the only problem with doing all that digging and making an hour long documentary is you can't put them out every week. It's like yeah, yeah. Not exactly the standard YouTube model, but <laughs> that's the way. It's, that's the way. But it's polished, it. and I think I think people appreciate that. You know, they know your, you know, your style. You're doing the research. You're writing. Uh, you know, like you call it, I know you call it a script, but it's like, you know, you're writing, yeah. uh, almost like a, you know, like an essay. Yeah. And then kind of, yeah. I don't know. It's, it's just really cool the way you, the way you do it. And I always look forward to those coming out and, uh, I even listen to them. Like I'm at work, I can't yep. watch them. Uh, so yeah. I, I listen to them. They're great to listen to. And then sometimes, you know, you're like, God dang it. <laughs> you got to go back <laughs> and pull up the video. To I have see to see that part. Yeah. yeah. What is yeah, he, yeah. what is he pointing at? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I'm honestly, I have the, cause I have a podcast now too. I, a lot of it, the videos, the, the audio from the videos mm. have made into a lot of the podcasts and I'm doing, um, podcast specific content now too, but it's, it most, I think it mostly works for an audio format. There are some moments of course, where it's like, Hey, I'm, I'm talking about this thing here that we're looking at, but that's it's because I think it's because of the process. I write them first, you know, and then I yes. then I arrange video footage around it. But there's you know, it's not not the whole thing's not just look at this and look at this. It's occasionally I'll I'll, I'll write something specific about a visual that I have in mind. But mostly it's just yeah, I'm just like writing about it, and you're just getting footage in the background of, of these sites and things. Yeah, it's cool. But thanks, folks. man. Like, yeah, it's- we're we're uh, we were at this uh, contact at the canyons event mm-hmm. in Utah. And uh, we had we had a day off this time. Like there was a yeah, there was an extra day thrown in. So it was like, well, <laughs> people can kind of go do what they want. So we went to rent, you know, the razors. We we're like, Ben, 
you want to go? And he's like, oh, I don't know. I saw this book in the lodge that was on pyramids that I hadn't seen before, and I think I'm going to go do some research. You know, he's like, that's right. <laughs> going there to read the it's book. Like, it's an, a book from the 1800s on pyramids that he hadn't seen. So it's true. he's, he's so, not yeah, going to go he's, off-roading. He's working, folks. Yeah. He's <laughs> he's out there digging, digging through the through the books. It's great. <laughs> and I, I, you know, when he told me he was going to go read it, I was like, well, can you read it out loud? Like, I'll sit there. <laughs> 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 I totally would. <laughs> yeah. Just, just lose the fake British accent, though. Just, but you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you inspired me, though, man. You, um, my name is Ben, not Bin. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Your name is Ben, not Bin. <laughs> bin. <laughs> He's the guy with the fake British accent. That's right. That's the best, one of the best. YouTube comments ever, guys. Like, yes. It's just like this double layered insult that's magic. It's just like you're not only are you faking your accent, you're faking a British accent. <laughs> God damn it, that's good. <laughs> I'm faking it and it's the wrong accent. You know, whatever. But yeah, I was going to say you inspired me like um, with, I can't remember what video it was, but you were quoting all this stuff from Petrie. I suppose a lot of your videos have his, his uh, work mm -hmm. in there, but I was yep. like, damn, I got to re, I, like, I got to get this guy's books. So uh, somebody in the Discord, that was probably Jeff, uh, threw me a copy or I don't know how it happened, but thanks to the people in the Discord that helped me with getting that, that yeah, book. The Pyramids of Giza. Yeah. Pyramids and, and Temples of Giza. Of Giza. Yeah, so yeah. it became like a nightly thing. You know, I'd get home from work and um, everybody's gone to bed and I'd, I'd just sit in there and have a beer for like 20 minutes every evening and just like yeah. read through this and scan through this this book. And there's just some awesome stuff in there, you know, there that, that broadens your perspective on on all this stuff. So it's, uh, yeah, it's great. I, Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's I, that's one, one of my favorites, that book. I don't know if it's chapter 12, is it? On this, but it's the, it's the, on the mechanical methods yes. of the ancient Egyptians. That's, that's a chapter that gets a lot of, a lot of use. Um, yeah, it's good. He's peaches. It's all good stuff. You can find a lot of this stuff on archive.org. I, I'd, I'd like to get a few more of the, his actual books too, if I can, uh, just for like a hard copy. Fine copy. Yeah. 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 But you, you'd be amazed. You just start digging into to what resources you can find out there on these. And what's one of the things that's led me to this conclusion? Like a, it's a point I make a fair bit. It's like the, the, the sort of the authoritarianism that's inherent in today's. I think academia and Egyptology and archaeology isn't something that was always there. It's it's almost a modern phenomena. I think it's something that's really only happened in the last fifty or sixty years. But that's it. You know, that's the era we're living in. So it feels like, wow, these guys are very resistant to saying, "I don't know." Yes. Uh, or, or, but that's and if you start to read the works of these guys, like Clements Marco or or, or uh, you know uh, Petrie or whoever, I've, I quote from a bunch of different sources. Of these, the gentlemen scholars, the explorers, like the the, the Victorian era, almost mm -hmm. the people from a hundred hundred years ago, thereabouts. They there's much more mystery there. Like they were willing, I think, to accept when they there was something they couldn't quite understand. And it's I, you know, my opinion on this, it's I, th I think it's because of the nature of the debate. I just think that those guys were, were able to discuss this. And so Petrie spent his lifetime arguing with his peers about his claims about the drill cores and the saw yeah, blades, right. But, um, but at the same time, he was firmly in the, you know, pyramids or tombs camp. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah, he, does, I, yeah. he works out that, like, he does have questions about it, but at the same time, he's like, so they must have, you know, yep. stacked the the uh, plug blocks in here, and then they had to pull the body in through this part and climb over the, you know, he, he's yeah, working out the yeah. scenario for the tomb. Uh, but, he is, and, and I, the way I look at that, too, is it's like, I don't think they had the context for... A, a more ancient past. I, I just don't think that that yeah. was a possibility than in the head. So I, when I see Petrie talking about stuff like that and him trying to reason about, well, it, the tube drills, they maybe they must have had bronze tubes embedded with jewels to make these marks. That's him. He's he's looking at the evidence and he's trying to like frame a a, a, a solution based in what they know of the dynastic Egyptians. This, the idea that it's technology beyond that or it was a civilization that wasn't them, it was older – isn't really a concept that that ever gets explored or even thought about. It's only now because they they were thinking of like humans like were basically in the Stone Age for like what ten thousand. They probably thought that humans were around for like twenty five to forty fifty thousand years maximum. Right at that point, uh, if if not even you know 
even shorter time frames, but it's only now that we have so much of this other surrounding context that supports the idea that, we're, okay, things could be a lot older and we've had the concept of cataclysm being proven out that we can explore those concepts a bit. It's a bit easier to think of them. It's just a, to me, it's a context picture, but you can almost, when you read his writing, you can almost see him like scratching his head thinking about it because at the same time he's trying to, well, it's bronze tubes with with jewels in it. But at the same time, he's looking at the striations and he's measuring these spirals and he's like, well, it, it's got to have had like, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten tons on top of it. And right, and it doesn't make sense to me. You do that to a bronze tube, it's going to warp and, and you, it yeah, doesn't matter how many collapse, jewels really. are in it, the thing, thing's going to collapse. You're going to crush but, it like a beer can. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, Especially with how thin he, he, they were. Yeah. Yeah. So he was putting it in that context of what where he thought the solution was. And, and I'm not sure he wouldn't have been open if he'd had all the data that that we have today that he, you know, I'm not sure he'd have that same conclusion. I, I, I suspect he'd probably be able, he'd probably think, well, okay, there's some other possibilities here. But just the fact that there was a lot of back and forth and arguing and, you know, they, they did that in the academic halls of residence, you know, is with his peers and in their letters and in their, their societies and in their, their, their institutions. But the whole nature of the debate now has shifted. You've got, you know, you've got your Hancocks and your Bovals and your, your, the predecessors of those guys, the John Anthony Wests and who does he always reference the um, for the Luxor? Schwaller de Lubitz. Sch Schwaller de Lubitz, yeah. yeah. So, and this has all happened in the last sort of 50, 60 years. So you, and the nature of the debate's changed. It's shifted and, and, and it was in books for a while and, you know, it, it's moving outside of the academic halls of residence and, and you know, all of that area. And now it's on YouTube and, you know, as I often say, like idiots like me can have a say and get an audience or whatever. <laughs> the same here. So, <laughs> it, yeah, it, it, but it leads, I think, the academics who are the authoritative figures in this space, right? They're the ones who, to quote, supposedly own this information they're the ones who write the textbooks they set they set and control the orthodox messaging uh they create the standard model so they and and you know their authority their sense of self-worth all of these things are tied into that concept so when it it gets challenged from all these different vectors i think that's sort of fed into this the i guess the more the more the strong response that, that that a lot of the stuff gets, which is just just flat out yeah. denial or ignoring it and unwillingness to really engage in debate in some of the some of the topics. So yeah, and there's yeah, it's un, it's unfortunate, but I think that's what's going there's on. There's something about the way the information has fossilized. I guess is the term I would want to use, <laughs> because like you guys are saying, you know, Petrie's asking questions, and he's and then you know the, the, these older. Egyptologists, at least, were willing to say, "I don't know," or that, that there's there's something strange here, or that we don't really have yeah. the full understanding of what was going on. But nevertheless, their discoveries get taught to the new yep. generation of scientists, and then that gets taught, and they they those guys teach the next generation, and then and then it becomes fossilized and set in stone, and all the questions <laughs> that were there in the original discoveries are forgotten. Yeah, you know, in a way, and and so it's it's just like it, I don't know. I guess it's, it's the it's the loss of the questions that these older Egyptologists were willing yeah. to admit existed. Yeah, I, I, it's a good. That's a great way of putting it. You're right because and Petrie is still considered like the authoritative source on a on a lot of measurements on a lot of these monuments. I mean, that's it's kind of ridiculous to think that how little has actually been done in terms of surveying. Accurately surveying some of this stuff yeah. for a hundred years, and a lot of it, he's still like the the best source we have for a lot of uh, a lot of sites. But at the same time, and that's what gets put into textbooks. But they don't ever talk about the fact that he think there was ten tons of pressure on top of a tube drill, right? <laughs> like, exactly. It doesn't that doesn't make the uh, the cut somehow? But and stuff gets yeah. lost. I mean, Egypt is just yeah. Egypt is so it like in terms of an archaeological site, it's so enormous. You know, there's yes. stuff everywhere. Like when we were out in the desert, where were we? I guess we were Abu Sir, Abu Ghraib, and you could kind of see like there were sites off in the desert where you could see the the tell. You know that there's mm -hmm. an area that's this got stuff there. It hasn't been excavated. It's just out there in the desert. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I don't know. It's just such an enormous site, so data gets lost. Yeah. I was I was, you know, I was amazed when we were going through. Uh, uh, Gantenbrink's story about how the uh, the e the the exits for the king's chamber shafts had been lost, like where they were on the outside of the pyramid. 
Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know, it's like they searching around. Yeah, them. they knew they existed, and they, and he knew that they had been found in the past, but nobody remembered where they were or wasn't written down, or if it was written down, that was lost. So he had to go find them again. I mean, it's even that way with the entrance, right? There's legends of the entrance. Yeah. At the time mm -hmm. that uh, um, Matthew, Alma Moon Alma Moon yeah shows up. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. just crazy how. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but on the, on that, you know, you can it, it it is a little bit under it, you can kind of understand it a little bit because you know you're talking about this enormous thing, and that, that I try to stress this to people that that pyramid is just huge. It's no. <laughs> thirteen to fourteen acres at the base. That's you know. If, so if yeah. you're like, okay, well, yeah, I've got stuff on my property that I've lost. I'm like, wait a minute. Where yeah, did where I, did I put that? Uh, where did I put that <laughs> giant pipe? I know it's somewhere. <laughs> yeah, it's just tall grass. I still can't find yeah, it. Yeah, right. Yeah, on ten acres. You know, <laughs> so you can imagine, like, well, I've got a fourteen acre structure, and somewhere on it, there's a door. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So yeah, somewhere. <laughs> somewhere's on like a four inch square opening. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. yeah. Like a four inch wide opening. Whatever the hell it is. Yeah. 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 It's crazy. It is it is crazy how big it is. And that that you know, that's the scale of it that is lost on people until they see it. But even and, then when uh, you're standing in front of it, you know, you're standing on the plateau and you're looking at it, it's it's huge. But you don't really begin to comprehend the acts the absolute massive size of thing until you start trying to circumnavigate it yeah you know yep. and you're you're like okay let's go over to this other pyramid over there and you start walking <laughs> you know and 10 minutes later you're Keep still walking, walking alongside walking. the same wall of the pyramid or whatever and it's just you're yep. like yeah this thing yep. is gigantic <laughs> yeah yeah it's ridiculous it really is i tell you just yeah it's one of those things you should if you it's go and see it if it's like a bucket list item if you're at all interested in these topics like yeah you, you want to see it at least once like this place it's you, you don't really – I always like and I, I will always remember the first time going into Cairo and driving towards Giza if you do it in the daytime. Obviously, at nighttime, you can't see them. But the first second you see these things just like looming over the, the rest of the city. Yes. Uh, you know, it's, it's just a pier on this horizon in the backdrop. And you just realize like, holy shit, these are, these are gigantic, like so yeah. much bigger than you think they are. Yeah. I mean, it was the tallest structure for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Um yeah, it's it's insane. Yeah. Do you know if anybody's gotten to the top of the other one? Like, how often do people climb that one? The 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 Kafre pyramid. Yeah. Uh, that one would be be a lot more difficult. I'm yeah, sure people have, to, have. Yeah, you'd have to do like you need ropes and climbing yes, gear for that, right? Because the top you still just, has the casing stones. Casing stones. Yeah. We'd have to be like you know what's his Alex Honnold or something could probably do it. But <laughs> you just stick your fingertips into the cracks and, and yeah. scamper up there. Yeah, um, and the bent pyramid. I'm sure I people about do. that one as well. Oh, that one would be even tougher. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's real steep. Land a lot more casing. Yeah, got much more of the casing stones on that. I'm sure people have. I, I don't know. I yeah, don't know. I think. I, I don't know. <sighs> yeah, it's unfortunate. I would like. I would have loved to have visited these places even 30 years ago, 20, 30 years ago, because then it was entirely possible to and easy to like go up these things. There's a time before that where it was just like, hey, yeah, just if you're intrepid enough, off you go. Yeah. Climb that thing. Would you climb yeah. it if they gave you the chance? Oh, yeah, absolutely. 100%. Yeah. Well, if it was, yeah, if I could do it without getting like arrested and Thrown ejected jail. from Egypt, never sure. to come back. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to do I would love to climb it. Yeah. I mean, we got to, we got on top of the satellite pyramid uh, outside the, um, that the bent pyramid next to it, you know? Yeah. And you can get on top of, I've been on top of the, the Abu Ghraib, the, the, the obelisk base, people think it's a pyramid. It's just a base for a gigantic obelisk. Um, yeah, I love, I'd love to the chance to climb it one day, but I don't know. It doesn't, I doubt that's ever going to happen. It's just like, they, you know, I could foresee like a p potential, if it, I, I, you almost don't want them to do it. Like, obviously, there's the, the path people can take where you, you spend an, you know, the whole money makes anything possible in Egypt approach. I've, I understand that's, Still a possibility, but it's th it's many thousands of dollars. You got to bribe everyone from the top down to the bottom. Apparently, yeah. uh, I don't even think even then I I wouldn't do it just because of the risk. I want to keep going back to Egypt. I don't want to be sort of thrown out of that place, right? Uh, which is I, what happens if they catch you. I think what would be even better would be. I mean, I understand the idea of like, yeah, I climbed that thing, but what would be better is to bribe people to allow us to fly a drone. Yeah, and you, you could well, look at yeah. multiple like close-ups and places yeah. that you wanted to see, and you know, fly that's to different pyramids and stuff, and you know, that yeah. that would be cool. 
you can do. I mean, the drone stuff is possible. It's just expensive and, and yeah. time. It takes yeah. a long time. So you, I've seen drone footage. Yes. yes, but it's just like the filming permits and production permits. Plus, then you army and and I'm sure they probably want to know what you want to do with it. And there's probably only you know particular institutions that have the access that can do it. That, I, I'd love that idea too. But I was just thinking with the pyramid, like you could almost envision a, a place where they're like, well, for special permission, like enough money, they could make it an official thing. But I'd, if they had to do that, I reckon they'd have to install safety gear and all this other crap. You don't really want to see that. Like, yes, you don't want right, to like, drilling sure. into it and putting up chains and ropes and shit. And I'd just be like, nah, because like, it's dangerous. Like, I'm sure I, I can't recall if this happened, but I'm sure there's people that have fallen off that thing and killed themselves. Oh, in yeah. The, in the hundreds of years that people have been climbing it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you when you know it's like that thing. If you just, if one if you're gonna allow someone to do it, you just don't want hordes of people going up and down all the time. But right, yeah, yeah. So it's just I think it's you know I'll just live vicariously through the tales of people that have done it, like Hancock going up there and finding his grandfather's signature up there or whatever. That's crazy yeah, that's story. A, is that that's a wild on. story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. so- we are going to Egypt again in we November, are. but I wanted to ask you what, you know, you've traveled all over the place and visited many sites, but what do you, you know, what other places do you want to go that you haven't been before oh, and for what reason? The long list of stuff there. Uh, I, I So the UK, um, for, for sure, with Stonehenge, the other, there's a whole bunch of other um, stone circles. There's a lot of just interesting... Um, architecture there as well not just the really ancient stuff and personally i also think it'd be really fun to like spend a summer chasing around crop circles i don't know why uh, yeah I just think, yeah like get on the radio and you just hey one's appeared and you just everyone drives over there and i think it'd be an interesting crowd it i'm be fun. all in for that <laughs> yeah like go chase crop circles around because they, they do that right and mm-hmm. hancock's doesn't it does it i mean hugh newman gets involved in it but just chase going because there's a whole crowd that does it yeah it'd be interesting uh that's that's a big one for me uh turkey haven't been there. There's, you know, go back to the Tepe plus a whole bunch of other places. That same thing for um, uh, Jordan, Lebanon with ba- Baalbek's like a massive uh, draw to me one day. I'd like to, I have a friend going there. Uh, actually, I think he's he was there this week. I haven't heard back yet, but he apparently took some high-end filming I want to go to the quarry there. Yeah. Yeah, the quarry, yeah, which is close to the site apparently. Um, if I you're not moving 100 and or, or a 1,200 ton <laughs> stone, yeah. Yeah, yeah or 2,000 sure, tons stone. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's close. Yeah. Just, just, you know, just, just some water. Just over the, the ridge old. there, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, that's that's a big one for me too, man. I yep. want to go I wanna, yep. I wanna go there. But obviously, Petra, Jordan, all the sites in Jordan, there's a lot to offer there. Easter Island, man, like this is going to sound stupid, but I haven't seen like the Temple of the Sun and the Temple of the Moon at Teotihuacan, like in, in Mexico. Yep. Yeah, uh, I've been through the Yucatan a couple times, but but like the southern part of Mexico and all of that, so many places. Um, there's a lot of other places like Guatemala and Ecuador, and there's, all these places have stuff to offer as well. Uh, I think that's interesting to to go look at. Um, a big a big part of me has been and talking to people as we've been traveling the last couple of years. I've mostly been going to Egypt and Peru because that's where I could get to. Uh, but I've been really waiting for like Southeast Asia and that part of the world to to open up again. I used to live in Singapore uh, for a couple of years, and I love I, a I love that part of the world. B I I miss diving. I did a lot of diving. I've done like three hundred plus dives, and I think an underwater expedition to some of these places. Nan Madol is one of them, but also Yonaguni off Japan. Yeah, uh, and you could combine that with a trip to like Cambodia, Angkor Wat, Indonesia, Gunung Padang, and and hit that whole area. I think that's that's a that's a very fascinating trip. I'd, you could bookend it with some really good diving because like Sipadan, places like that are just fantastic diving. Um, I just and I just personally really miss diving. Um, so there's a, there's a lot. There's, Malta. There's, I hope. Have you been to Malta? Malta Malta's one hundred percent on the trip. I haven't been to Malta. I've been to through uh, Italy, though. I've spent quite a bit of time looking through there. Europe's got a lot to offer. There's a Gothic cathedrals. I've always had the, I had like a little crazy itch to. Gornaya Sharia in Russia. I mean, that's just quite an adventure even getting to that place. To oh, look at yeah. It. Yeah. Uh, that would be cool, like in Siberia. Um, just because apparently it takes several days, like off roading in a vehicle, which I, I just like the idea of trying to do that. Um, yeah. There's there's an endless list of stuff to try and do, I think. Um, I, I love Egypt. And, and it's, you know, I, I think Egypt's still like the best place to go to really absorb a lot of this this stuff. Like it's, 
Egypt sort of is at the top of the list for um, megalithic remains and ruins, but there's an awful there's an awful number of sites out there as well that I I haven't seen yet that I want to try and get to at some point. Yeah, India too is In, full of full oh of, India. I didn't, yeah, I didn't make the list. India. I've been to <laughs> India a few times, but you know I've sort of seen the Taj Mahal. Like there's there's so much, and I've been to a bunch of the cities, but there's so much more in India. Like I'm fascinated with the Barabar caves. Yes. Uh, yep. All the temples, you know. I like the work of Praveen Mohan. Like he shows so much, so many interesting and intricate details of those sites that just boggle the mind. Um, you know, Ethiopia for that matter. There's yeah, stuff everywhere. Oh yeah, there is. Yeah, that's right. There's yeah. megalithic stuff there too. Yep. Yep. Those I'm done with China. Templar, <laughs> Templar temples. Yep. Go in there and uncover that pillar that's supposed to show how they would cut those things. Yeah, you remember that from oh, signing yeah. the seal. <laughs> <laughs> yep oh man yeah let's do it yeah go and see what's in that little church right show me yeah show me that show me the ark all right guys well yeah you got anything else any other questions i just i guess you mentioned the bar bar how do you pronounce it bar 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 uh, the BAM videos that they mm-hmm. isn't, isn't that what they were looking at? They they look like the precision flat surfaces of the Serapium. Yeah, they're they're, they're they're even more precise. Yeah, they're they're the they're yeah they're incredible. <laughs> so if people so. haven't seen this, I'd recommend checking out Patrice Poyard's work. He's um, director of he he also the writer director of uh, Revelations of the Pyramids. Although he's I don't think he wrote that. He directed it. Um, Jacques. Uh, Jacques Grimault, I think, was is based on his unpublished work. It was Revelations of the Pyramids. A lot of people have yeah. seen Revelations of the Pyramids. Great, great film. Great film. Um, done with Patrice Poyard, who's a friend of mine. Uh, we've talked a couple times on my channel, and he's uh, he's done a follow up to that called Builders of the Ancient Mysteries. And one of the things he touches on, along with like Antikythera mechanism and whatnot, are these caves in India, which are carved out of like granite outcroppings. They're like carved straight into this granite yeah. rock. Uh, yeah, so and he's like done a, a follow. He, Go it's ahead. a precision room. Yeah. Right. A it's a precision cut room that has like arch ceiling and f- perfectly flat walls. And it, it's they're and they're huge. It's just, it's yeah. amazing. They're polished. They look like the interiors of the Serapium boxes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. In, in, insane precision. And he also had the ability, and this is where I just, this is the thing I always yell and scream about is he was able to scan them, like take in yes. a $70,000 LiDAR scan, a proper LiDAR scanner, not not me running around with a you know an iPad, and and scan these things. And the result of those scans was so profound that they're doing an entire film on these Barabar caves and what it means because it's revealed a whole bunch of aspects of those things that just is is mind bending. So they're not the the walls aren't exactly straight either. They're, they're both both walls are, are sort of in tilted in by something like a degree, degree and a half, like it's barely perceptible, but they're perfectly symmetrical. Like, And, and you've got the flatness that they've measured on those walls is down to like 1.5 microns of flatness, like far, <laughs> it's like the, the flattest thing that they've that they've been able to measure. And then the, the geometry that's come out of these scans is, is, is in, incredibly impressive. And there's a whole number of these caves. Some of them are circular as well. There's, there's rectangular rooms, there's circular rooms. Some of them look like a ship from Star Trek. Like it's just... and it's it's and they're incredibly polished and we just it's just kind of a mind bending effort of how they did them and of course there's some crudely scratched writing in in a, in a yes. couple of places on them that's been hammered into these perfect walls and that's the orthodox explanation for them right that they were they were built by some king to a local cult or sect so that they could shelter from the rain that's right. more or less the story <laughs> <laughs> it's like from the monsoon you know. Because it gets it gets a little rainy in that area, so hey guys, we'll make you these nice caves. Um, <laughs> yeah, chill. and it's a, it's a perfect example of like the <laughs> exterior doesn't matter. The interior yeah. space is is what matters. Is what matters, and it has to be incredibly precise. And so it's like you know, if form follows function, this yep. is it, it falls right in the same mystery as the as the Serapium boxes to me. Why did the interiors of these things need to be so precisely done? You know, what, yeah. what type of, uh, what, what are you trying to contain Yeah, that has to yeah. have that, you know? Um, Is it the nature of the tool 
or is it the purpose of the enclosure? Yeah. So on the one hand, yeah. you have a place where you can enter. And so maybe it has something to do with the human, you know, maybe it's just mind blowing to go in there. Um, mm. But the boxes in the Serapium do not seem yeah. to be something Endorsed. that you're supposed to enter. Yeah. So that's kind of like, yeah. you know, uh, and, and the cave that they're held in is definitely not precise. It's so I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, I, I don't understand any. I I just I come back to that whole like well there's a reason for the precision it has to have been developed for some sort of function whether it's a function related specifically to those caves or not I don't know I, it feels like it is to me just it's just so much effort to to polish them and to get them that perfectly right. symmetrical and there are multiple chambers like a lot of these rooms they're not just the one room there there's like a an, another room in them or something there's there's gaps uh yeah so there's there's a whole bunch of them. And and they're all slightly different. And actually, and here's another case of duck tools down. One of them's not finished. Ah. Like there's one of them that that has like an un, it's unfinished, and uh, you know it's as if the tools went down. And then you can see some effort where the later cultures have come and tried to do something to it, and it's just like they like chip the surface, and and in like hammering away at something, and it's like oh well that's you've screwed the whole room. Like none of these other rooms have anything. Like that's the pro, that's like the most amazing thing about like a, the Serapian boxes. And these caves, it's like it's a single piece of stone. Yes. Yeah. And when you're doing some reductive process, if you go too far anywhere, you are screwed. Like, yeah. It, and that Start just doesn't over. seem to happen. It's crazy. It I'll, I'll name another site <clears throat> that I would love to go to. I, it is in China, the Longyu Caves. Oh, yeah. Longyu Grottos. Yeah. Yeah. Longyu Grottos. <clears throat> I'd love to see those. Yeah. I'd love to get yeah. There's uh, a lot of places in China I'd like to see as well. I agree. I've just been there too much. And what's that quarry oh. to the Yangshan? Yangshan quarry. Yangshan or Yangshan quarry. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Would love to go there as well. Yep. And they've got no end of pyramids dotted all over the place. That they're they're hurriedly more well, the last thirty or forty years been growing trees on them. Over. That's right. yeah. <laughs> just just plant <laughs> trees on them, guys. <laughs> this, this they won't be able happen. to see them after a while. If, if it wasn't if it wasn't Chinese culture, it doesn't exist. So. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm just I'm just you know not a big fan of the the CCP. Right. And, uh, and I've been there probably twenty something times just with the IT career. Ah. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I got to travel a little bit, but uh, you know, there's a yeah. I was just like, eh, I go to a lot of other places before I go back to China. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, cool, man. Thank you so much okay. for yeah. coming on. Thank you, Ben. And it's been a great conversation. Thanks for the invite. Yeah. 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 It has. Thanks for the invite. It's always looking a- forward to the next adventure. Yeah. Indeed. Yes. Let's do it. Meanwhile, you guys can get a hold of us, Brothers of the Serpent at gmail.com. Check out the website, Brothers of the Serpent.com. Ben. It's unchartedx.com or uh, YouTube slash C slash unchartedx. More or less everything there. I'm on social media as well. All the links are there. All right. And uh, yeah, support Ben and his work. You can do that probably through his website, right? Uh, yep. You got links there. Slash support. Yep. yep. And we have uh, the Pyramid Scheme, so you can support us as well. Do that through Patreon or PayPal. Thank you guys so much. Uh, thanks to all of the Discord people and all the Twitch Sup, people y'all. on, on yeah, Ben's stream. Tr- streaming live on Twitch. Yeah. Uh, we, love, we love all of you guys. Always have. Indeed. Always will. Good night, Adamu. Get back to work. Back to work. <laughs>